he's taking off it. <laughs> it's carnivore's video. You're right. Now, for the Arnold treatment. Got you there, Lil. I'll fucking lip sync this. Yeah, crank it up. Let's see the sweet go. So so this, this is what heavy metal guys do on their days off. Just take a picture of Peter's car. I don't think a picture of Peter's car. Yeah, this is one of Peter's car. Wow, look at this engine. That engine's nice. That's a nice engine. You know what that engine is? What is that engine? That engine's nice. <laughs> but let me ask you, is that a nice engine? That's a that's a nice engine. Come on. <laughs> that, that, that's very nice. I must oh, that's what's wrong. <laughs> What's happening? How's everybody doing? Listen, I can't guarantee a lot in this life, but I will guarantee this. We're going to have a great show today. I've got a good feeling about this one. Yes, sirree. This is going to be good. This is a guy that I've been, I've been after today's guest to come on the show since this show started almost three years ago. So very excited about today's show and i hope you are as well uh what's up robert hogg in scotland yeah hey yo i got your agros record signed robert i hooked you up at the paris mayhew event yesterday at generation records i got it yeah you know what good one right nice shirt i, I like these three-quarter old school 70s throwback baseball type shirts so you know Debo the Pro, what's happening? New York Hardcore Comics represent. That's right. Need I remind you that this is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live, and we are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill, The Texas Silver Rush, DTFM Vinyl Distro, Generation Records, 126 Hardcore Clothing, and Upstate Records. There you go. Uh, come one, come all. Uh, Larry the Hunter, nice to see you yesterday, man. Thanks for coming to the event. That was great. Yeah, the aggro. Yo, come on now. Listen, all you Brooklyn motherfuckers better be tuning in. That's all I can say. And Michael Scandato, the whole, listen, it's a big Brooklyn themed show today. You know, Scott Earth, what's up, man? Um, a lot of Brooklyn talk today. And uh, this is going to be great. This is going to be great. Uh, so I'm excited about it. And, and I hope that you are too. Uh, that said, that said, that said. Hello. You all right over there? <clears throat> yes. Ah, what's going on? <laughs> what's happening? Uh, not too much. Not too much. What's what's that shirt? Is that a what's that Marvel uh, Comics? Shirt. Old school, old school Marvel Comics. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Oh, man. All right. Crazy, crazy weekend. Yeah, that's right. Weekend started in the middle of the week. and still going. Listen, my weekends used to, listen, back, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, I know my lifestyle back in the day wasn't unique, but it would start on a Friday and basically end on a Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know? Hey, did you see, uh, you know, while, while we're at it, uh, Biohazard's playing, uh, headlining the first uh, Milwaukee. The, the Milwaukee Metal Fest is back. And I don't know if a lot of people know this, but Jamie Jasta from Hatebreed basically 
is you know the force behind the Milwaukee Metal Fest now. He oh yeah, yeah he uh, you know he owns he bought the name. He, I think the Milwaukee Metal Fest ended a couple of years ago, and Jamie you know you know bought the brand, and now this is the first year that he's that he's resurrecting it. You know, and the funny thing is, they're the one band not on that list. This Hate Breed, yeah. He's probably but he got, did, but he did get one of his favorite bands, that being Biohazard. To oh yeah, their first show in the USA on Friday, May twenty sixth. So yeah, this looks absolutely relentless. This festival. Yeah, I I couldn't handle this, man. This is too much for me, bro. So many. I mean, so much. There's so much there. Yeah, oh, I, you man. know. <clears throat> Yeah, there's some real bangers on here. Oh yeah. Well, Maybe. I mean, there's so many. Fear Factory, Fear Factory with that new singer, man. I'd like to see see that. You know. I can't even read some of the stuff on the very bottom there. Yeah, it's rather than that and like impaled feces and like uh, Cap decapitation. Yeah, cattle decapitation and like you know Actually, wire hanger are... abortion. You know. My 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 death metal uh, taste has been growing lately, actually. Yeah, yeah. I see shadows fall, Lamb of God, putrid pile. Yeah, the bottom putrid ones. Pile. The bottom ones look the most fun. You know. Yeah, for Pu sure. Putrid pile. There's a, there's a. We're, they do we're all love songs. We're putrid pile, and you're <laughs> not. So yeah, listen. They all, Biohazard also teased that they're playing Irving Plaza. You know? Yeah. So the little teaser about that. Mm hmm Yep. That's gonna be I think that's a perfect place for them to start, honestly. Yeah. Because they can't be somewhere where there's seats like for a biohazard show. So Yeah. Listen, it's a it's a uh that's where they ended up. That's where mate, that's where the best offer was, and that's the venue that they played before and they like, and 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 there you go, you know. I would have loved to have seen them do the park. <laughs> that. Come on, stop it. I know. Hey, listen, we want you guys to play in the park, and you know, <laughs> listen, play play in the park is difficult because there's a lot of um variables. You're asking a band like that to play the park. It might rain and the whole thing might be a washout. It's right. like, that's a lot to hang your hat on, bro. You know what I mean? That's, yeah. That's, that's a lot to hang your hat on, you know? So, you know. I mean, and I will was... there be a biohazard documentary? Yeah. Shit. Supposedly. Yeah. <laughs> Supposedly. Another thing I'm not particularly at liberty to talk about, but. Supposedly, they said there was going to be one. You know, you would, like to, you would like to think so. <laughs> the perfect time. Yeah, yeah. Hope so. Hope so. Hey, let's do photo of the day. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, let's just uh, let's jump into it. Let's not play any games. Ah, here. you picked a good um, one. Let's just ju let's just jump into it. Um, yes, obviously. You get a this looks like our friend's uh, Life of Agony. Is this from last night at the Starland Ballroom? No, this is actually from Empire Live in Albany uh, on Thursday, on, uh, what is it, Thursday night. Ah. And uh, they did Empire, Empire Live was the opening night of the tour. That's the big room, that's the big room. Uh, yeah, the, up there, right? the upstairs room, which I believe is uh, like 1,600 people or something. Like, And it was sold out, Sold right? out sold right. out and it was great it was obvious it was life of agony is sick of it all it was a band called coventry carols right. and our friends in faded line who by the way were great that night mm. faded line really were great and then um and then uh faded line was off the bill for the starland show was a band called omnism came on instead right along with coventry carols and sick of it all and uh but, I heard uh, that. I heard. Yeah, and you went. You went last night too, right? Yes, I went last night without my. So you want to know something? I got to give props to Veronica. Like, Veronica is a great drummer. 
Oh, she's an and, and like I'm not even gonna. I'm not even trying to be like, yo, you know, you know, she's a great female drummer, whatever. Yo, no. she's a great drummer. Period. She fucking, she's better than ninety percent of the dude drummers out there. You know, she's you know, awesome. you know she's a great you drummer. Know, was great. I was actually standing like right on the side of the stage, like parallel to her. So I was actually like filming, like, you know, when you see like the drum videos with just the drummer, uh -huh. yeah. I was filming a lot of just watching her play. She's such a, such a tremendous player. And there's our man. Listen, you know, I, I, I want to, I want to give, I want to a moment to acknowledge that Lou Kohler from sick of it all has got that kind of Dave Vanian, uh, you know, like a little, you know, it, he, he's growing old gracefully. It, it, you know, it's like, he's sort of like, he's doing the Joe Perry, like, I'm just going to let this little gray, yeah. like, couple of gray hairs show. That's that's all I'm giving you for now. You know, it, it's a good look. It's kind of like a Dave Vanian, you know. Yeah, look. exactly. Dashing yeah. vampire look, you know, the... Uh... yeah. You know, got to give a shout out to Lou, by the way. He has been coming and supporting the Bowery Electric shows on a regular yeah. basis now. Lou Kohler is, I've said it before, I've said it, I've said it again, is in my opinion, and people ask me like, yo, favorite front man in hardcore, oh. Lou Kohler. Lou Kohler, and not just front man, but just all around persona. He supports other bands. You know, he, he, he gets out there and then... You know his, their 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 act, um, is great. Yeah, yeah. The 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 clocks went, the clocks went, uh, the clocks went ahead here, bro. Bring That's ahead. Right. So yeah. Everybody in Europe is probably like, is is missing out on the show, right? You know, uh, it's funny actually. Speaking of Lou, as as I was leaving yesterday, the show. Uh, he stopped me and he was telling me how excited he is that we're having Abaddon from Venom on the show. <laughs> of course. And he's yeah. like, oh, I got great Venom stories, you know? Yeah. Oh, these guys. Man, they yeah, just. Got, listen, you, you know what? I got to say this. You know, these guys, I get tired. It's exhausting just, <laughs> watch, just watching these guys play. It's like these guys do more exercise. Like. It, like the combined four of them do more exercise in one of their sets than I've probably done in the year. <laughs> and Pete, Pete, especially, I mean, yeah, Pete is like it's, twirling into splits, like in midair. He's incredible. Yeah. It's like, it's like, it's like a, an aerobics fucking, it's like the Jane Fonda workout, you know? You know what? If you could, create like a thing like like if, if sick of it all could power they're, they're like solar power like they could power a small town yeah like the the sick of it all like yeah <laughs> but i gotta tell you man them and life of agony back to back the machine about a generator here right he is there. the machine Ugh. you know i love that i love that the life of agony kit is right behind him too there yeah yeah just, just the, the best. I mean, and the combination of the two bands, I, which I had seen about five years ago at the Paramount, they just crushed it. They just, both bands, like, people left there just, like, exhausted and happy. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a great, uh, the show last night was at Starland Ballroom, right? Yes, Star, which uh, is a 2,600 people, I think. That place sucks. And it was packed. It was so packed. And we had a great time. And I that, saw that fucking Dan place, Starland Ballroom, is like uh, you know what it you know what it reminds me of? Starland Ballroom. It, it reminds me, it reminds me of this. It reminds <laughs> it, it reminds me of like so ya thought you might like to go to the show. It like <laughs> reminds me of like that scene in Pink Floyd the Wall. It's just like it's sort of an oppressive place to see a band. It's like super uptight. It's a Live Nation room, you know. It, it, a place is, uh, yeah. It's, it's, in the, it's it's a hike too. I mean, Sarahville's, yeah, not that close. 
but uh, yeah, but it was not, not one of my favorite places. And the people, the people that run, the, the people like that work there treat you crappy. You know, it's like you get there, and it's like get in line. You know, everything out of your pockets. You know, and him over there, he's a Jew. You know, it's like woo. But you know, the funny thing is that you say that because we were in the the spot that's like a VIP spot, uh-huh. right next to the side of the stage, and this little female security guard came through the whole group and I was right against the stage and literally tried to throw me out. Like she got really nasty with me and everybody was like looking like out of the blue. And luckily, uh, you know, um, Alan and his tech and everything gave them the like signal, like, yo, he's with us. That's what they're all about. That's one of those venues that like treats the people that come in there like they're the enemy. Like, like the people, the patrons that are actually paying, you know, these fucking people's salaries, you know, Mm. they treat them like they're the enemy and like any sort of like, they're just looking for any infraction to fucking, to throw you out and hopefully beat your ass in the parking (laughs) lot on the way out there. You know, they'll have to get me next time. Yeah. Fuck that, man. You know? Yeah, I'm not down with that, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they don't like rock and roll. It's like, you know, I, listen, I'm not even going to go any deeper to the next level, but I'll leave it at that. Yeah, there you go. I live 10 minutes away and Drew, you nailed it. Listen, <laughs> bro, I, you know, I didn't just fall off the back of a turnip truck. You know, it, it is literally like, you know, you know, get in line over there and like, what? You got something to say? You know, like they just want, they just, they treat people like they're the enemy in that place. You know, you know, the funny thing is when they told, when, when they told her from the stage, when they told her I was, I was good, yeah. she actually said to the artist, you're making my job difficult. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They prefer country bands. Yeah. So. Whatever, man. You know what, as we used to say in Camp Delaware, them, them, fuck them. Right. <laughs> All right, man. Excited about today's show, man. Oh, yeah. I'm excited about this. I'm excited about Louie, you know? Excited, man. A guy we've been chasing down since day one of this show. Yeah. So, I yeah. remember. All I right, remember now. the early short lists, you know? Yeah, he was on the short list. It was like, you know, so excited. All right, we'll talk to you in a bit. Oops, sorry. Talk to you in a bit. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> hey, don't change, man. Well, there you have it. This is the one, the only, often imitated, never duplicated, clank your chains and count your change, the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. We are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, the Organic Grill, the Texas Silver Rush, DTFM Vinyl Distro, Generation Records, Upstate Records, and 126 Hardcore Clothing. They're a streetwear brand for restless individuals who don't compromise. They are about being positive, spontaneous, and true to yourself, my friend, for years. They experimented with several printing methods and materials and collaborated with a large number of designers and illustrators, always giving room for fresh perspectives while retaining the hardcore attitude. Get in touch with them. Ramp up your game at www.126clothing.com. Come on now, Devin. Fargo, North Dakota represent. Looking for extreme music? DTFM Vinyl has got you. Located on 13th Ave in lovely Fargo, North Dakota, We have the state's best selection of punk, hardcore, metal, ska, oi, and more. Can't make it in? Shop online from anywhere in the country at www.dtfmvinyldistro.com. DTFM Vinyl, where the policy still is and always will be death to false metal. That said, let's clear the deck. Let's make sure everybody's okay. Uh, Hello, Holly. Welcome aboard. Paulie Porkchops. What's happening? Lou Rizzo, Gary, the gang's all here. Uh, Lori Dawn. Is that right? The House of Blues is like a lot of a lot of the House of Blues are like that. Like the patron is the enemy. Like we, it's like, get the fuck out of here. You know what? It's shit like that that inspired me to do these shows at the Barry Electric that are fucking free in all ages. I fucking hate places like that. I don't give a shit. How's that sound? <laughs> All right. Uh, hey, cuz. Hey, what's up, cuz? 
Hey, did every did uh just a big uh I see I see Cuz out there. Just real quick, I want to shout Cuz out. And if you don't know, now you know. It's been mentioned before. The Black and Blue Bowl, uh, which we're going to be talking about a little bit later because our guest played one of the, the great Black and Blue Bowls. Black and Blue Bowl 23 is coming up. I've said it before. I'll say it again. Uh, respect to Cuz Joe. Uh, mixed it up a little bit this year. Put a lot of the younger bands on and went for a little bit diff different uh, – you know, kind of tone. And uh, I think that's great. Uh, mixed it up two days of May 12th and May 13th. Look out for it, the Black and Blue Bowl. Also, there is the show in the park, uh, the uh, Tompkins Square Park show uh, that is coming up on Saturday, May 15th. Once again, the mighty, the one, the only, the mighty Mad Ball is playing Tompkins Square Park along with a special guest, And the Capturers and Vulture Raid. So come on, get up, get down, Tompkins Square Park. There you go. Uh, that said, let's clear the deck. Good to see everybody. It is a great flyer. It is. That's a. That's one of the. That's a Gary. A Gary Gilmore flyer, right? Oh, did I say it wrong? April fifteenth. My bad. I'm sorry. A, a, April fifteenth. Come on down to our beloved Tompkins Square Park. Uh, means so much to all of us. Uh, Cuz has done a great job through the years and put on some legend, legendary shows. That said, listen, what can I tell you? Fucking roll up your sleeves. This is why we're here. <laughs> this is why we're here, you know? Let's get down, man. All right? I'm warning you. Here we go. Today's guest is an American drummer hailing from the bastion of musical talent, Marine Park, Brooklyn. He is known for his work with the band's Fallout and Agnostic Front, but is perhaps best known for his long-running musical partnership with Peter Steele in the highly influential crossover thrash metal band, Carnivore. Please welcome, coming at us from Orlando, Florida, Mr. Louis Vieto. Hey, man. It took you long enough. It I know. Took I'm you sorry. Long enough to get me on the show. I'm sorry, bro. <laughs> no, I'm not talking. I'm just joking with you, Joe. I was so excited. No. I was so excited to have you on, man. It's cool. I, I uh, I'm happy to be here. And look, we got we got our carnivore red on in, in celebration. I got, I got my well, Lenny and Is John. Is that the Lenny and John shirt? That's the Lenny and John shirt. All right. So those in the know, <laughs> yeah. you know, Jack Daniels and pizza. This <laughs> this was the pizza. <laughs> and, and and a little Lenny and John's history, of course, Evan Seinfeld delivered pizzas for Lenny and John's. I did too. We walked. Oh, did you? Yeah, around the same time. I was wow. earning a little extra cash to get married. So it was was delivering pizzas for Lenny and John that lucrative at that point? It was, they had four delivery guys right? a night, and, and we rarely saw each other. Wow. They delivered from Sheepshead Bay all the way to the junction. Which is a good stretch of Brooklyn. That's that's, a, that's far. And what 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 would you do? You you get on the Bell Parkway and 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 and, and deliver? Head out? No, that mostly park? mostly up and down Flatbush oh, Avenue. Oh, oh yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Lenny and John's man. Listen, uh, let, for those who may not know, Lenny and John's is still there, worldwide known for their rice and cheese balls. <laughs> oh yeah, I used to love their spaghetti and clam sauce. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The spaghetti for sure. It, you know what? Lenny and John's is still there, and it's still pretty good. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Still, still pretty I've, good. I, 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 bet, I haven't been there in about six years, I'd say. But yeah, they expanded the place since. Uh, yeah, they say did. Day. Yeah. And um, yep. I saw Danny there. You know, he still works there. Yeah. Yeah. It's still. It's still. It's still great. That's that said. You know, um, I think one of the reasons. I'm excited about you being on the show. And I just found this out is that, you know, you and I are, are you know, I am 19 days older than you. <laughs> hey, you so, so we really, we really, you and I grew up in New York City at the same time. And we're, we're pretty much exactly the same age. So like, I feel, I feel connected to you in a kinship because we were both, 
you know, uh, pummeled by the same influences growing up in New York City. You Absolutely. Know? Yeah. Did you, uh, did, so tell us, how did you come up? Did you grow up in a musical household? How did music come into your life? Um, musical household, not so much. I mean, my parents listened to music. Neither of them were musicians. But I, I think my neighborhood was very musically um, inclined. Um, I mean, I lived across the street from a schoolyard on East 33rd Street in Brooklyn. Um, and um, there were always boom boxes playing, blasting Zeppelin, Stones, Who. You know, so it was always, it was like the soundtrack of my youth, you know, all the classic rock. Yeah. Um, and I just kind of like gravitated towards Zeppelin. That was like, yeah. That was my first gig, uh, first show, uh, actually. Um, Is that right? In 1977, it was the first concert I ever saw. At the Garden? At the Garden, yeah. I was 13, I was almost 14 years old. Wow. So, you know, after I after that, it's like you say to yourself, you walk out and you're like, now what? Yeah. <laughs> you know, but. Um, yeah, they, they set the bar, you know, really high. And, 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 and just putting it out there, because, you know, I was growing up in another borough, but the stuff that we were sort of hearing, you know, back then was like a lot was like Led Zeppelin, Bad Company, um, yeah. you know, um, uh, that what, Led Zeppelin, Bad Company. Aerosmith. Aero you know, you uh, know what also, you know, I remember purple. getting the purple. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. all the stuff that really, you know. The who? Through. The who? The who? The Who was like the original punk band, right? Yeah, The Who, sure. Yeah. So, so you you go see Zeppelin. Were you playing drums at that point? I've been playing drums since I'm six. So how how drums? <laughs> so how, how it drums, started? Why why drums? Why? Here it goes. Um, my cousin, who was older than me, um, had a drum set at his house. Uh, I think he got it for Christmas and I gravitated toward it. I just, you know, my parents saw that I took a keen interest in it. So they, um, I think it was the following Christmas or, or I guess my sixth Christmas, they bought me, uh, you know, nothing like not a real drum set. It was one of those, you know, yeah. toy sets like cardboard skin things, you know, and, uh, it didn't last very long. Um, the skins broke on it real quick. And, uh, it kind of went to the wayside. And then uh, I remember when I was eight years old, I got another drum set for Christmas. This time it was more, you know, substantial. It was like a Japanese set, nothing, no name brand or anything. But uh, that really got me um, more along my way to, you know, started taking drum lessons. Is that right? That, as, that, as a young person, like, you know, and, and, and I know there was a culture Back then, Sam Ash, the music stores, drum lessons. Who do you take drum lessons with? Well, initially, I had a guy come to the house. I don't, I'm not, not sure where my parents found him from, but uh, it was horrible experience. This guy used to come in to my room at where my drums were and light up a fat cigar, and my eyes would be tearing as I'm trying to read the music. And I'm like, you know, I didn't even think to say, hey, dude, put that cigar out, you know. I was a kid. He was an adult. That's just the way we were back then, right? You know, you, yeah. you didn't think to, like, speak out, you know. Sure, but, um, sure. you know, and again, I was only eight years old. So, yeah. um, so you know, you have the attention span of a flea at that age. So you don't really, you know, yeah. um, catch on. But it wasn't until I got into my early teens, um, 13, 14, I think it was around 14 years old, um, that I actually found a drum teacher that was real, real, really good teacher. And I studied with him for like five years, I'd say. Mm -hmm. And he was, a, he was, a, he was a, a, a major influence on my playing because he was, um, his goal was to make you a drummer, a drummer that can read music, go mm. to Broadway, Get a gig in a, mm. in a you know yeah. on Broadway, read charts, sure. not have, not have to rehearse, just put the charts down. You lay down the drum track, you know. Get gigs in studios doing uh, uh, commercial jingles, you know, before drum machines became a thing. You know, they actually used real drummers. <laughs> they needed right. people to read music. You know, these these people that did the commercials, they would just put sheet music in front of them and. There would it'd be like one take, you know. They they'd read the music, play the thing, and collect their check and go. 
That's yeah. the kind of drummer he was. Uh, and that's, that's why I had a pretty well-rounded education uh, with, with all styles of drumming uh, through him. His name was uh, Norman Wayne. Great guy. Yeah. Who, who I, I know, you know, of course, we touched on John Bonham, but who, who were drummers er, like early on in, in, in your development that, that you really, that, that spoke to you, that, that really, that, that uh, inspired you? Um, well, I used to, you know, it's funny, you talk about what, uh, influences, you know, what was popular back in my youth was block parties. Block mm. parties used to happen all the time in Brooklyn. Sure. And there would always be live bands playing, you know, all classic rock stuff. Sure. And I used to love crashing these block parties. It was like a thing, you know, you didn't even have to get invited, you know. Yeah. You just went. And um, there were all different, like, just neighborhood drummers that were, that were, you know, banging it out and, like, you know, really, you know, throwing their own flavor. And, you know, you know you'd listen to a song, uh, uh, a Rolling Stones song, and you know how it sounds on the record, and then you see somebody interpret it, like you know, and you're like, yeah, you could do that, huh? You can, you know, you could throw your own flavor into it. That's that's interesting. I like that. I like that. It doesn't have to be exact, you know. Um, so um, really, to, for me to like have any like particular drummers as my uh, as a youth, there really weren't any, you know, besides of obvious choices like John Bonham and sure. Um, and and uh, Neil Peart was definitely, I mean, one of the greatest compliments I think I ever got was when someone told me once that I sounded like a blend of Peart and Bonham. And I, you know, that's, I was like mission accomplished. That's great. Yeah. Um, but then later on in years, I my, uh, I, I got heavily influenced by a, a, a guy named Joey Dadiego, who was um, a guy uh, who was um, a conga player. Mm. And um, there's actually a significant story about that. Um, pretty much every a lot of people that we're going to talk about today, we all used to work for Joey Dadiego. I, I started working there first. We used to make handmade Latin percussion instruments. Wow. Um, and um, this, this shop was right on Quentin Road, down the block from Zappis, right down the block from, from Ace London Studio. In so, fact, so, so I, I, let, let me let me stop you there because I, I want to do a ref. I want I want to do a reference here because a Zappa's reference. Let me just yeah. Because I think we should color this a little bit because this isn't. People might not know what we're talking about here. Zappa's yep, is. Z, Zappa's is, is is like a forgotten venue that existed. You never hear anybody speak about Zappa's. Zappa's was a a club in Brooklyn that hosted a uh, incredible when, when you look at, at at some of these bills which i i have one right here you know zappas had here here's a zappas a lot of bands came through zappas a lot of known bands here's a strip from uh i'm not i think uh from the early 80s dead kennedys a, a lot the shirts a lot, lot of local bands but uh, the sick fucks. But Zappas was a place that that had like live music constantly, right? Yeah, it had a lot of new wave bands. Uh, ah, back right. In the day. You know, a lot of bands that started with the word the. Right. The shirts. Yeah. The this, the that. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, that was also. I remember. Um, I think Evan was talking about it when uh, he said his band before biohazard played there it was called the hangout <laughs> and um he played like a matinee show and that was right before fallout actually played uh there um here's an interesting one at zappa's uh flipper with with opening for flipper the replacements at mm. at, at zappa's in 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 83 you know yeah. Yeah. I think even like Blondie and the Ramones played Zappas at one point or another. There were a lot. In fact, Zappas re used to be on the corner. The other, the, the Zappas, that picture that you showed was closer to uh, 36th Street, I believe. I think mm -hmm. the, the original location was at the old Camelot Inn, which wow. was on the corner of 35th Street. It was a bigger place. I never actually was in there. Cause I was, you know, wait, that was my neighborhood though. I lived like yeah. right around the corner. 
But right down the block from there was a shop that we used to make these Latin percussion instruments. Mm -hmm. Here, I brought a visual aid. This wow, is one of, see that. This is my cowbell that uh, was actually made as a handheld bell without the handle. And then I told Papo, put a, put a handle on it. I'll throw that on my kit. And this so, was... So so that looks like that is that hand welded? Did you guys oh, weld? Yeah, look, that? look at that weld. Look, wow. Look at, look at that weld. This bell is like 40 years old. <laughs> right? And, <laughs> woo! That, <laughs> that's great. So that's great. yeah, the, the name of that company was Jopa. Oh, oh J, 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 J Backsass, is that the Predator Cowbell? It sure is, brother. Is that right? That's of course. That's the bell. Wow. That's the bell. I only have one bell. Well, I have two bells actually, but that's the bell, and uh, just the one drum kit that I play. I recorded all my shit on Fallout, Carnivore, and Agnostic Front. And they're still in the garage. Let Let me ask you. This This photo looks somewhat familiar i do know the history of this photo could you could you could you gleam us on on some perspective on this yeah uh this photo was uh on the wall of sam ash outside wall uh one of many uh, uh pictures murals of um musicians that they decorated the exterior wall of the sam ash location on uh, queens boulevard mm. uh, we were um, pretty close with the um, location on uh, Coney Island Avenue and Kings Highway. Right. I remember uh, that place. Yep. And um, I, I just recently uh, purchased my drums from them. And uh, they asked me if I would pose on the drum kit for, um, you know, for this purpose to have it. Uh... And I remember when they redesigned the store, they actually contacted me and asked me if I wanted it. And it was like three times the size of like, you know. Yeah. I was like, they were huge. I? I was they, like, they, right. were, they were huge. They, and they had like the dude playing bass with the big afro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And somebody else on trumpet and this. Yeah, 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 and yeah. a whole line of musicians. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's where that's from. Hey, our, our friend and supporter, Mikey Dijon, says the Latin style percussion on God is Dead makes so much sense now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it was uh, very much, you know, the. I had a lot of Latin um, influence from uh, hanging out with this dude, Papo. And, and um, you know, he taught me how to play congas. And uh, we actually, they're very muted, but there is a conga track on the studio recording of God is Dead. It's kind of right. buried. But uh, we were kind of rushed in that production. Let's, let's talk a little bit about, and, and we're going to bounce around a little bit, but you did, you did mention Fallout. And yeah. uh, I, I got you sent me you sent me a couple of great shots, but uh, you know how did Fallout come together and who was in Fallout? Well, Fallout was um, already formed. Um, they were an existing band. Um, I was looking for a bass player for for a band that I had um, started. Uh, we were playing in my garage, and, uh, and um, we needed a bass player and. Um, it was a kind of rough decision actually, because for me, I had a, my best friend was playing bass in, in my band and he, he really, you know, he just wasn't playing bass long enough to be, you know, proficient enough at it. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, I knew I was going to have to find somebody to, to replace him for us to move any further. Um, the guilt got to me so bad that when I went to Sam Ash actually to, um, look for, you know, they used, they used to have like a bill. Every music store has like a like a, like a bulletin board where you sure. can find you know sure. musicians available or whatever. Mm -hmm. So um, I got a couple of bass players' phone numbers, but then I saw this wanted ad on a postcard that said "wanted psychotic hyperactive drummer to complete four piece um, metal band Fallout." and I thought the name sounded familiar, but I, I you know, I wasn't really sure. Um, but I took the number and I uh -huh. told myself I, I got on the bus back to go back home and make some calls. And I told myself, well, if I had no luck with the bass players, I, I'll, I'll call up the uh, this number to see if I can audition. Sure. 
on the way home, I'm I'm on the B2 bus going down King's Highway, not the B2, the B5 going down King's Highway, and I'm noticing flyers on the uh -huh. poles now, the light poles. As, as you're on the bus looking as at I'm the As I'm on window. the bus, because I thought, like I said, it looked familiar. I'm going, sure. holy shit, is that the band? Yeah. Like, they're out there already. They're already playing, you know? They're doing it. Yeah. So I was like, by the time I got home, I said, fuck it, I'm just going to call them. Yeah. <laughs> And I forgot about it. I said, this way it'll be easier. I'll just leave the band and join another band. I don't have to hurt my friend's feelings. That's right. That's right. So I called on a, it was actually Pete's number. And right. um, when I called, uh, Pete was a really nice guy. I mean, you know, I didn't know what he looked like or anything. But, you know, we kind of became friendly really quick on the phone. And um, he was telling me about the band. And he tells me, um, he's asking me about me. And what school you go to? I said, uh. I go to Nazareth. He says, oh, maybe you know my guitarist, uh, John Campos. Uh -huh. And I go, John Campos? John Campos is in this band? He's like, oh, you know him? I said, the dude's like a legend in my school, man. A, Brooklyn, a Brooklyn legend. I was like, holy crap, this guy brings his acoustic guitar out to the track and he'll play like Pink Floyd and Zeppelin, all those really cool acoustic songs, you know? And the drool would just be like with your mouth open, like Holy shit, this guy is incredible. Sure. Now, now I'm psyched. Now I'm like, oh, I'm going to get a chance to jam with John Campbell. Whether I get in the band or not, I, this is fucking great. Sure. So I went down for the audition. Um, it was at Josh's house, actually. Right. They had a studio, he had a studio in his and, and let me just let me interject for, for those that, yeah. may, that may be watching. The Josh that, that Lou is, is referencing, this is Josh Silver, who in this picture is on the bottom left. Who, of course, play keyboards and later resurfaces in typo negative. That's the one. Yep. Yeah. 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 And um, <laughs> and it was funny because I my my father drove me. I was too young. I was only like fifteen at the time. <laughs> my father drove me over to uh, Josh's house. I rang the bell. He comes to the door. He says, "You the drummer?" Yeah. Around the back. I was like, "Oh shit, this guy's friendly." Okay, so. <laughs> Unloaded my drums. I said, Dad, I don't know if I'm going to have to call you back to come pick up the drums or if I'm leaving them here. I'll let you know. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I went downstairs and they had like a whole entourage with them. It was like all their friends, like the roadies. And, Ooh, that's uh, intimidating, it was, it, huh? Yeah, it was kind of like it was weird, you know. It wasn't just the band, you know. I was like getting scrutinized by everybody. But, um, you know, I'm setting up my drums and um, then we started jamming to some like I, don't know, I guess like Sabbath and Zeppelin and, and stuff, you know, and um, and then we just started jamming, uh, like you know, like musicians do, you know, and and it clicked. It just really clicked, you know, and um, John uh, Peter. Oh, well, that was the other thing too. I mean, I have to say the impression that Peter made on me when I, I'm, you know, he had to like literally bend his head in the basement so he wouldn't have hit his head on, on, on the ceiling, you know, like he right. barely fit down there. And, and I was, Peter, was, yeah, Peter, was, Peter was six, seven, right? Six, seven and a half, I think maybe yeah. six, eight. I mean, yeah. like, like alarmingly large, you know, like, yeah, like sure. you're like, fuck, like, wow. Like not just tall, like you're like yeah. fucking wow. Like yeah. I didn't, like, why didn't you tell me I was on the phone with you for an hour. How come you didn't tell me you were a giant? Um, <laughs> But, you know, I was equally, I, I was like equally impressed with all of them. I mean, these were some serious musicians. I mean, Peter, his fingers were all over that bass. And, and Josh was phenomenal. And John was just like, he did not disappoint. It was like a really, really great experience. Just, I'll, I'll never forget that day. And, and did you feel, did you, feel, I mean, you say it clicked, but so I'm assuming like right out of the gate, you, you, you really sort of held your own and, and, and planted a flag. Well, they went upstairs. I was left down with the entourage. Oh, they geez. told me, dude, you're so in. You're so in. Holy shit, dude. You're so fucking in. They're going to come down and, you know, I was like, yeah, you think? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> cool. And, um, and that's when they came down when Josh came down with the, um, with, with all the, the, you know, photos of their previous gigs that they were doing saying, right. you know, we're, we're uh, an old, and that's the thing that was unusual. You know, back then yeah. you didn't play a club unless you did covers. Sure. 
sure. not even Twisted Sister were playing clubs yeah. without doing. I mean, they're. 80% of their sets were, were cover tunes. They used to do Zeppelin, Sabbath, you know, uh, Judas Priest. Um, sure. They, you know, Ozzy. Lot, they did, lot, yeah. I mean, you Twitter. couldn't get into a club doing originals. So it was really hard for Fallout to get gigs and really had to do a lot of self-promotion. And uh, hence those flyers. I mean, they used to plaster flyers all over the place. We'd go crazy. You, you, you sent me a couple of pictures uh, of fallout playing these are incredible photos man and because uh here's one of them here and you know this is a photo that speaks to me having grown up in in in, in the five boroughs this is fallout playing the naumberg band shell in central park and uh just incredible Th there's you and that's josh uh you know uh with the keyboards but this is these are incredible photos. Here's another one of uh, of Pete uh, uh, early. I mean, and this is, I mean, teenage, right? This is a teenage yeah. Pete Steele playing in Fallout, right? Yeah, Pete's probably eighteen there. Yeah, yeah, that ba that bass, man. Yeah. And, and I've never heard of such a thing. I I had no idea. How did Fallout end up playing the Nauberg band shell in Central Park? Uh, you'd have to ask Richard Tamini that. Uh, okay. <laughs> I right. don't know. I, honestly, I know, I think, I'm pretty sure he got us the gig. Yeah. Um, you know, um, I, yeah, I didn't know the particulars of how that happened, mm -hmm. but um, it was pretty cool. Yeah. That, that's, uh, I, I spent many years. Here, here's another one. Uh, Another great. These, are, these shots are so great, man. Uh, here's another one. Boom. Yeah. You know? and, and, and there's Josh playing the guitar, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and that's and that's funny because Josh actually that that's you know Josh was ahead of his time. Also, I mean, he had he had this one that he bought. This is when uh, Moog actually finally came out with uh, the, the Liberation and. Um, but before that, Josh had one custom made. I, I, I think it might have been a Moog where he separated the keyboard from the uh, the panel, I guess, or whatever. With, yeah. and, and so it had a wire on it that was connected. But he was able to play it with it like wow. strap, like like Edgar Winter style, you know? Sure, like, sure, Frankenstein you know? style. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, and uh, Matt Melnick, uh, good friend and supporter, Dark Side and and uh, Downlow uh, says, yeah, he called it. It's a Moog Liberation, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You you don't see many of those these days. You just no, I guess not. <laughs> no, you don't. You don't. You know. But uh, just, just I got to put this photo up again. It is just so damn good. Uh, this kit, this kit you're playing. Uh, you know, I I, I, I got to bring up the fact that you're a lefty and, yes. you know, uh, you're a lefty drummer. Could you, could, for, for the uninitiated, could you clue us in on sort of the trials and tribulations about being a lefty drummer in this world? Well, you know, I, I can't tell you how many drummers you see or I see that are clearly lefty drummers right. that just play a righty kit, right. you know. When they play their hi hat and their snare, instead of cross playing, like you know, cross sticking, you'll see them ride with their left hand on a righty positioned hi hat right. and play the snare. You know, like you know, and it always gets me. Like you know, when you do fills now, you know, you, you, if you're a righty, you lead with your right hand. If you're lefty, you lead with your left hand. How do you not sure. trip yourself up if you're playing around the kit? With uh, you know, a righty righty position, uh, right. trying to lead with your left, and it just doesn't. I don't see how that can work for you. Sure. Um, again, this is a result of me being, you know, having lessons and being properly taught. You know, right from the beginning, you're lefty. This is how you play the drums. You set them up this way. Um, with that said, you know, it's not a lefty world we live in, and yeah. um, you know. Uh, it's always it's always a problem, uh, you know. I can. I mean, never I would think I would think for I think when you're on a bill with multiple bands, being a lefty, it like you have to switch everything over. 
it, it's yeah. a whole fucking ordeal, right? Especially when, you know, back in the 80s when the kits were big. I mean, you know, it's yeah. not like with these um, abbreviated kits that everybody uses now. So this is why you were so insistent on always wanting to play on your gear. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I get it. I, I, yeah. I totally get it. Hey, uh, our old friend Anthony Mio says, uh, <laughs> says Mr. Vieto, you are drumming royalty. It was an honor to set up your mammoth kit and watch you perform. You are the OG of double bass hardcore. You showed me everything. I love you forever. I love you too, Anthony. That's nice, it's, man. Thank yeah. you, Anthony. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah Matt Malik. Yeah. yeah. Who were your drum influences to motivate to get a six rack tom kit and probably a floor too. Yeah. Well, one, here's the thing. You know, one, John two, three, four, yeah, six. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was a 10 piece kit. Um yeah. Yeah. it's a combination of John Bonham and Neil Pert. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, you know, uh John Bonham had 26 inch bass drums. Yep. So I and Neil Pert had two bass drums. So I had to get two 26 inch bass drums. You know, here's the thing. I ordered these drums without ever trying them on. <laughs> okay. I went from a 20 inch bass drum Gretsch kit um, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, to this monster set. And I will never forget bringing them home and then saying, Holy shit, I never realized the spread. My fucking legs are going to have to spread. <laughs> I'm going to have to do stretches just yeah, to yeah. reach my hi hat. <laughs> and it really was. I was like, Oh my God, did I make a mistake? I was like, Well, fuck it. I got them yeah. now. I got to make it work, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but. Um, and I'll tell you too, 26 inch bass drums are not easy to play. It, it definitely takes more effort to control. I mean, I find that like if when I'm in a studio, it, no one has 26 inch bass drums in a studio. Usually the biggest you find is 24, most commonly 22. After playing my drums, I go on a 22 inch, you know, two 22 inch bass drums. It's like, you know, running with ankle weights and then taking them off. Yeah. And you feel like you could run so much faster, right? You know? <laughs> so I see you yeah, got yeah. the floor. Yeah. Hey, I got some. Where's yeah, my yeah, please? Here? Hold on a second. Yeah. Let me see. Go ahead. Talk about it. Here, I got it. I got the Fallout shirt here. Oh, that's huh? the original Fallout shirt? Not really. Um, uh, again, my friend, Mr. Tamini, hooked me up with this. He's down in Australia now. Um, could you, could you, so Fallout actually put out the single, right? Uh, he what? Oh yeah. He produced the single. Yes. He, he produced the single. And, uh, could you, could you tell us about, uh, the, uh, the, the, your first, I'm assuming this was kind of your first experience in the recording studio. Were you happy with this? And, uh, you know, give us a little, give us a little background on, on this uh, initial experience in the recording studio. Which was, which was, excuse me, by the way, 1981. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, was I happy with it? Um, I, I'll tell you, both songs on the record were abbreviated mm. for like possible airplay, I guess. But I don't even know how that was, would have been possible because there were profanities on it. But, um, <laughs> um, it, and, and, and I, I think Rich, agrees that um, there were some really good parts of, of it that were cut out to make the uh, songs shorter. But he was working with another uh, producer, William Whitman, who mm -hmm. was um, kind of the one that got us the studio time. It was, um, I forget the name of the studio. It was someplace in Manhattan that we recorded. Um, and it was like definitely like the first real professional studio that um i got to to record in um where like you know big bands play i i, I think um pink floyd recorded there and a few others wow. i forget the name of the studio something but like anyway. Ster sterling sound or sterling sound, of... that was it sterling get sound. at it did i nail it sterling yes you sound? did yeah in fact if you look at the back of that i think i might even say it yeah i I just thought I, I just sort of put the pieces together, and that's the. No, it was it was Sterling head. Sound, yeah. Yeah, and um, I mean the production was good, you know, but like I get the big bucks. <laughs> but it was disappointing to not have the songs in their entirety, you know. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, some of the best parts, in my in my opinion, got cut out from it. Sure. So 
so fallout sort of runs it runs its course uh, uh um you, you were around you know for another year or two uh josh on keyboards uh and 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 we'll get to this later but i just want to say you know richard is sort of like the unsung hero uh when it comes to the carnivore stuff his name comes up a lot uh you yeah, yeah he yeah. was he he involved himself a lot with us um you know he was definitely um a good friend of the band you know he in fact he um he's the one who hooked us up with our our manager uh mm -hmm. connie barrett at the time right um so uh there's there's a lot of good things that rich did for us he, he was a he was a big fan of the band you know yeah. it wasn't like you know i i think rich just had a genuine um desire to see something that he thought was really good, you know, uh, have an opportunity or, you know, give it every opportunity to uh, get the exposure it deserved. And of course, we'll touch on this later. He shot these iconic photos of, of Carnivore. Uh, you know, he, he did these great, great shots of, of Carnivore, uh, Mark, Mark one, we'll call it. And, and we'll get to that in a bit. But so from the ashes of fallout comes disciple, right? Yeah. Tell us about yeah. it. So Fallout um, split in half, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, Josh and John um, formed Original Sin. Mm. And then um, Pete and I, because uh, we kind of went, had different um, thoughts of how the band should, um, you know, progress. Right. Um, and... Josh and John were leaning more towards, you know, mainstream commercial sound, you know, air playable type music. And uh, Pete's uh, writing was getting more uh, like underground, more, you know, even heavier than what we already thought we were. Um, and uh, so, you know, that's that's why it, it broke up. It was actually I was very sad to see that. I, I loved Fallout. I really did. Mm. Um you know, it was such a great band. I mean, there was a lot of talent in that band between John and Pete. You know, John and Pete collaborated on, you know, all the songs. And, um, you know, together they were just really a, a great team. And they, they just made really – John was probably the best guitarist I ever played with. I mean – Did, did you really feel it – did you feel at the time that – I mean, was it, did it segue into a new beginning or did it sort of both, th did it collapse and you kind of felt, oh, fuck. That, yeah. That. Yeah, I felt empty, man. I felt yeah. it was horrible. It wasn't like, yeah. you know, I mean, it, you know, I mean, I guess it just evolved that way. You know, that's yeah. just the way things happen. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, uh, they went their way and, and Pete and I were then, you know, doing our own thing. And we were looking for a guitarist for a long time. And Pete was already writing songs and he would play the guitar. He would record the guitar. And then um, I'd come down, we'd go in his, you know, in his basement, he'd play the guitar part to a click track. And then he would play, we would play, you know, together, he'd play his bass and I'd play the drums and we'd be playing to the recorded guitar. And that's just how you, we- Just you and him. Me and him. And that's how we rehearsed a lot of our songs. Right. Um, and then, you know, still in the meanwhile, looking for a guitarist. And um, right. and then when we find, you know, a guitarist, we can then show him the guitar parts. And um, the first guitarist we had in, in, in the band, um, well, actually, there was a, a guy named Larry. I don't know his last name. Right. He was from Long Island. And that's when we were, um, you know, calling ourselves Disciple. Um, Disciple. And um, Larry was in the band for maybe a month, but he was all, all the way out on Long Island, and, and the you know commuting into Brooklyn was uh, really not convenient for him. And I guess you know after thinking about it or whatever, he decided he didn't want to do it anymore. So um, did, did you play out with him? No, not at all. We weren't. No. We didn't get out of Pete's basements for like. <laughs> like a year maybe a year yeah. or two like almost i mean like it was it was a struggle it really was yeah, i mean yeah, yeah. Uh, then we got stan stan pillis uh, yes. was in the band for a while this is a and, name i'm familiar with yeah, yeah. and stan yeah. um we did our first show at zappas as yep. carnivore as carnivore 
because uh, that's that's what happened. the way the, the name changed was we already had a, the song carnivore right and um we um were thinking that you know disciple kind of sets uh, a theme of like black metal it would make you think like black metal Fair enough and we Fair really enough. weren't weren't black metal so you know yeah. and um uh Pete was like, well, why don't we just call the name the band Carnivore? We already have the song Carnivore, you know. It's just easy. Makes I was like, sense. yeah, I'm I'm good with that, you know. We we just we just did the same thing with Incendiary Device. You know, we we had the song Incendiary Device, and hey, we got the song. Let's just it'll, it's yeah. like our it's like our theme song, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. and then we played our first gig out with uh, Stan. And that was the first time the the that's that was the the birth of the costumes with shoulder pads. I was the first one to do that. Um, I had um, borrowed a friend's shoulder pads that uh, he wasn't using anymore, and I draped a you know some fur on it from like a you know it wasn't real fur. It was like uh, the, the 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 liner of like my mother's coat that she wasn't using anymore, and I just kind of sure. draped this fur on it. You know it was. I made it in like 30 minutes before the show just to like, you know, put something really quick together. And then, sure. you know, <laughs> it looked like I was wearing a couch on my shoulders at first, you know, was, was, I mean, I, I don't want to get, I don't want to jump forward because I want to hear how Keith Alexander comes into the picture. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, it was after that, that, um, we, um, I guess started having second thoughts about having Stan with us. And um, we uh, started looking for another guitarist. And um, again, um, you know, it, it was funny. You know, you, we, me, Pete and I used to take for granted, you know, that if you're a musician, you know how to jam. You could just kind of like, you know, yeah, just pick up, you know, and just kind of, you know, sure. jam. I don't know how, to, what, how else to, you know. And it, it, it's so many auditions resulted in me and Peter just jamming and these guys like stop playing and like, look at us like, you know, what are you doing? Like, you know, yeah, aren't we going to play a song and we're like, we, we are playing us, you know, this is, you right. know, this is music. This is what we're doing. You know, just like, you know, <laughs> throw a lead on top, you know, do something, you know, but, um, um, I'll, I'll tell you when Keith came down, I was like, damn, this guy looks the part. You know, he's got, you know, he's got the beard, the hair. He just, he looks like a Neanderthal. He's going to fit. Keith was, Keith, Keith was another Brooklyn guy, right? Yeah, he lived in uh, Bensonhurst. Right. Uh, Di well, actually, Dyker Heights, I think you'd call it. Right, right. Um, yeah, and um, and he was totally psyched to be in the band. He really was. I mean, yeah. Keith Keith did a lot for the band. Uh, he, he was basically... Um, he was the one that reached out. Here, let me show you some stuff. Hold on Please. a second. I got stuff over here. Come on to, now. To share with the class. Uh, <laughs> Keith used to do a lot of like, uh, we used to call it arts and crafts. Like here, this is Keith's work. Keith did a lot of promotion for the band. You know, this is the original cut and paste, okay? This is before you had computers to do stuff. Sure. Uh, everything was cut sure. and paste like this. So yeah, this, yeah. Was a, this was the flyer for our demo um right that, that that keith made keith used to um interact with all the fanzines you know it, there was no internet you know you had to you had to make contact with people uh, uh let's see what i got hold a second you know this there, there were fanzines like especially in europe it was all well this one's not from europe but th things like this i mean this is this right. is like ancient shit you know yeah yeah um, and Keith was the one who corresponded with these people to let to make them know of Carnivore's aware uh, that we sure. existed, you know, sure. and uh, kind of put us sure. on the map, you know, got got us notoriety, you know. So, um, but um, here's a nice here's a nice early shot. Of, yeah, uh, this is one of my favorite. This is yeah. a good time. This is such a good time we had. We're at my friend Walter's house. Tying one on, as you could see, the Jack Daniels between Peter's legs. Um, yeah, you know, you don't get to see many pictures of Pete smiling and having a good time like this. You know, here's we were all 
very jolly that day. Let's put it that way. Well, I mean, th this yeah. this is one of those precious shots that really captures the moment. You know, you could just tell. You know, uh, when you're a band and you're spending time together, and it's and and it was an exciting era, and and yeah. everybody and and everybody on top of the world. I mean, this was uh, you were on yeah. top of the world. The feeling is like just you know, yeah, you, yeah, you, you know. Yep. You get choked up thinking about it. You know, you do because it's I, like. I, 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 absolutely. And I relate because, you know, when, when we used to start playing in the high and the mighty, it was like you get together with your friends, you get a bottle, a couple of quarts, you get a nickel bag, you know, of reefer and you all get together. And it was, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a great time. It was magic. It was magic. It was yeah. really, it was, it was, it was you looked yeah. forward so much to it. And, and even Paul, Paul, Paul Stone says, uh, over in Europe, you can feel the bond and com camaraderie in the, in that photo. Absolutely, Absolutely. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's good stuff. stuff. Yeah, good stuff. Um, you know, an, another. And I know that that was a, a, a very early shot, but uh, here's another one of Richard's shots, which are you know, dare I use the word iconic? I mean, these shots are so incredible, and and I have to I have to just get confirmation. You know, uh, be, being a uh, a New York guy and always having a vehicle and driving on the Belt Parkway, this location is right off the Belt Parkway, right? No, actually, it's right off Avenue U. Mm. At, at 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 all the way at the end, right? It's um, well, if you know where Marine Park is, it's right across the street from Marine Park. I don't I think see. you can gain access to it the way. You know, this was a yeah. dump. This was a, a yeah, you know, people right. used to bring cars here to burn them. And yeah, yeah. there were wild dogs in there. And I mean, it was, it, this was just like, like the wilderness of Brooklyn. It was like, let's, you know, go, let's go take some band photos there. Yeah, man. It was perfect. It was perfect. It was so Brooklyn. I mean, any, everybody knew the, we used to call it the Creek, you know, and, oh, the um, creek. right. Yep. you know, and, sure. uh, you know, the, there's there's other photos. Some of these photos are awesome because like we're standing on top of a car that was burned like five years ago, rusted, got algae growing on it, and it yeah. blends in with our camouflage pants, and we like look like we're just part of the car. It's, it's sure. fucking great. Sure. That's some, that was that was a lot of fun doing that. Yeah, that that, that, that. and you you know what's cool about those shots is uh, about a lot of those shots are that they're out there. You know, like the shot that, that, that you could see these photos, you know, they're, they're, mm. they're really, they're, they're, they're really great. Um, so, soon after Keith joins, do you guys go in and, and, and do, uh, hold on, do this, the Nuclear Warriors demo? Is that soon after? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. It was, um, I mean, we, um, we did, uh, what did we do? We did three songs. We did uh, World Wars Three and Four, mm -hmm. Carnivore, and uh, I think the Subhuman was on it. Right. Or maybe not. I don't know. Was the Subhuman on? I don't, I don't know. The Subhuman was a very long song. It was right. a 15-minute song. Um, it was it's like The Subhuman is like, what are, like the great sort of lost uh, a Carnivore track. It, it, yeah, it is. It's like, it, it's like yeah. the sound. It's, it's <laughs> like, you know, it belongs... It, 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 it could have like a short film unto itself, you know. Sure, sure. But yeah, but it was shortly after that that uh, that we went into systems too and recorded um, recorded those songs. Yeah, and after that, so soon after that. Well, oh, I have I have to wait. I got a couple of you know we're, we're kind of skipping around, but I just 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 real quick I, I, as we're kind of as we're kind of edit. I got a couple of flyers. Uh, this is one of the earlier ones I have. Uh, you know, Carl Carnivore demands you to attend. Yeah. And, and, you know, just talking about, like, the, the circuit back then. This is, like, at, at, uh, at, at October's, at Shears in Deer Park, uh, with special guests of T.T. Qu T. T. Quick, and, and, and at Lemoore's. You know, we've often talked about the circuit back then and how live music was just such a part of, of, uh, of the world and of, of New York city back then. And I did, I did, uh, one guy I talked about it in length with, uh, was JJ French from, from twisted and how back then live music was kind of everything, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, um, 
you know, you, you it, 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 that was like the thing you did, you know, you went out, you, you couldn't wait for the next show. You know, you went, you went out, you, you, you saw all these different shows back then, you know, I mean, I, I guess every generation has that, you know? Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, especially back then, it seemed a lot of bands were emerging and, uh, yeah, that's a good one. I like that one. Yeah. That was fun. That was shot right outside Lemoore's like after a show. Ho ho Holocaustic cacophony for skinhead bangers and slam thrashers. That yeah. sounds right out of Pete's vocabulary. Absolutely. <laughs> he was, he was the word master. You yeah. know, if the word, if the word didn't exist, he would, he would make it up himself. At Carnivore, demand that you attend. Yeah. Yeah. I, I got one to share with you, Drew. Hold on please, a second. Please. How about this one? I don't know if you've ever seen this one. Let me see. Hold on. There's a story behind this one. Yes, please tell us. Okay. So this August 31st show at the show place. Yep. Okay. Besides getting lost on the way to the venue, and it's funny, I got the directions to the gig on oh, the back of the flyer. So that's I can, fucking great. So you know this is the original thing, right? From how many oh, that, years that, ago? That's fucking great. Um, the show place. Okay? In, in, Do in Dover, New Jersey. Dover, New Jersey. So we're playing Friday night. Now, I don't know if you recall, back in those days, especially around that time, the drinking age in New York was 18. And Jersey right? was yeah. 21. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right? I think then they changed it to 19. Before in New York, they went. They had a, like a year where they went to nineteen yep. before jump, jump, you know, jumping it up to twenty-one. Right. Well, anyway, uh, we're doing the show uh, at the at the show. Uh, what's this? The show place uh -huh. and Friday night. And guess who's playing Saturday night at the same club and and shows up to the show to our show? Slayer. Ooh. Yeah. So. We find out there's a commotion by the door. We're like, what's going on? And someone said they're not letting Slayer into the club. And we're like, why not? Because they're not 21. I was like, they're playing here tomorrow. Well, that's different. They can play, but oh, they, can't, they can't come and hang out at, at, at a club with that serves alcohol and, uh, you know, and we were wow. like, are you fucking kidding? I was like, so Slayer came here. They're playing tomorrow. They want to see Carnivore play, and you're telling us no? So we said, well, fuck it. We ain't, we, we're not fucking coming in either then. Wow. And uh, it was funny because I talk about this uh, with my wife. Wow. She, doesn't, she doesn't remember it, but she was actually under 21, too, at the time. Wow. And they finally compromised and said, okay, is if they stay by the bar under the bartender's supervision, oh my god, they'll they can stay for the show. Oh, have mercy! So, so it was Slayer and my wife hanging out at the bar because they were underage, and we and we went and, and we played the gig. You know, I I I, I got to touch uh, just on the on the on the show place. Uh, here here we are, maybe a year or two later. Uh, when I was in the high and the mighty playing with agnostic front at the show place. Ah, you know? how about that? So you know yeah. of the club. Uh, do, not only do I know of the club, let me, let me, uh, it, here it is here, but I have a vivid memory of the drive to the club and how long of a trip it was and how like it was out in the middle of like, it was a huge drive. I remember, uh, but this is us. Yeah. We played, Show place with Dover with AF and I don't know, this is 83 or 84. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And it was funny because when we showed up, they actually had on the marquee, they didn't have the name spelled right. They had it as Kalnazor, C A L N I Z O R E. Kalnazor. Wow. I was like, I should, we should have known it was good. And the, and the funny thing is, like I said, we got lost trying to find the place. I pull over and I ask somebody directions. And I'm from Brooklyn. I don't know, you know, my way right. around or or how they, you know, the, the roads and stuff. So somebody tells me, you know, oh, yeah, you got to drive up uh, about a, about a mile. And then when you get to the jug handle, uh, make the left and then come back. And it's like two blocks over. I was like, so I'm driving and I'm and I'm looking for a jug handle and I don't see any jug handle. I'm going, where the fuck is this jug handle? So I 
pull over. I ask somebody else, where's the jug handle? And they go to me, which one? I said, there's more than one? And they go, where do you want to go? And I told him, and he was like, yeah, you got to go down and take the jug handle. I was like, take the jug handle. I was like, I thought the jug handle was like a convenience store that sold milk or something. The jug handle, I'm looking for a store called the jug handle. <laughs> so... Well, also what what I do what I do remember also is back then every you know you would have the Rand McNally map in the yeah. van in the van I eat right? that while you're driving. Yeah, yeah, and, and you're like you're like looking at this thing as you're driving. Yeah, you know? yeah. It, it was yeah. it was a different world, kids. It yes. was a, it, it, the struggle it, was real. The struggle was real. It's not like put the weight yeah. in, 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 you know? in anymore. Um, we're going to take a break soon, but I want to ask you about, yeah, before, before we, before we take uh, a break, I want to ask you about this. Boom. Ah, this is, th this is the set that we were talking about before, right? This is the only set. This is it. Joe, let me, let me make that clear. Yeah. This is the only, these are the only drums. I ever played, besides the the Gretsch drums that I first started with Fallout, I right. recorded Fallout, I recorded uh, uh, all the Carnivore stuff, and I recorded uh, Agnostic Front with that kit. And look, Joe, I even got a shirt for that. Let me see. Oh, wow. I remember that. Oh, wow. I don't, I, wow. On the Is threshold of extinction, I am. Wow. Let me right? anything on the back? No, just that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And, and somebody asked before, like, how did you cart that around? What vehicle? Did you guys have a someone must have had a van, right? Or a we always, we always rented um yeah. either uh a trailer and towed it, or we yeah. used to you know have a truck. We used to have a truck. Um did you go I, did you did you like go to Ryder and get like that trailer in, in Brooklyn? That, yeah, I, well, U-Haul. I used to go to U-Haul. Oh, U-Haul. Yeah, U -Haul. And get and get like the uh, the twelve foot trailer. Yeah. Um, either that, or we rented a truck, or we had somebody had a van. You know, so they, they, these yeah. drums used to fit in Evans' uh, Dadalac. These yeah. drums fit in the Dadalac. Yeah, man. We used to throw them in his car sometimes in a Is pinch. You right? know. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. By the way, what what, what when we're referencing the Dadalac. Our friend Evan Seinfeld, his dad gave him the Cadillac, and it was known as the Dadillac. Yeah. And literally, the drum, the, the 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 excuse me, the trunk in in the Dadillac was the size of my apartment, my studio apartment here in New York City. As, it was uh, huge. The trunk as, was. Remember, the trunk was like the fucking. As Robert De Niro would say, you could fit three bodies in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. The Dadalac. That is that is. I haven't heard that in a minute, man. It, 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 that 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 is great. Uh, yes, Chris Chris Contos knows uh, the Dadalac. Yeah, that, that's that that's that's really great. Um, let me take uh, let's let's take a sponsor break, um, and uh, we'll come back with Sid the Kid, who hasn't been on in a while, and we're gonna, we're going to do album of the week with Sid the Kid, and then we're going to go on. We're going to talk about Carnivore Mark II, uh, uh, you know, with with Mark P. Vanetti. And we're going to talk about uh, agnostic front cause for alarm and all that. So a lot to come. We'll see you in a bit. Okay. That's right. You got it. It's the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. What do you want me to tell you? Uh, exciting show today. Uh, lots of lots of history. Uh, you could just see uh, from the smile on my face. I'm, I'm very excited about today's guest. Um, we're going to get down. Uh, for a while. Show might go a little bit longer today. Uh, that's how it goes. In the meantime, let's hear from some of our sponsors. Since 1992, Generation Records has been a mainstay of the New York metropolitan area music scene. Today, they offer a diverse selection of new and used rock, jazz, indie, hip-hop, punk, hardcore, metal, blues, soundtrack, and reggae LPs, as well as t-shirts, posters, and other merchandise. They buy used record collections and music memorabilia and will pay you top dollar for them. House calls made for large collections in the tri-state area. Call 
or email generationrecords at gmail.com and follow them on Facebook and Instagram. Hey guys, Vlad from Organic Grill. As you can see, we're in a new location on West 3rd Street, right by Blue Note and Comedy Cell. The place is bigger, kitchen is bigger, we have more varieties, more food. We are looking forward to treat you guys with great dishes. All Hardcore Chronicles, welcome to, to Organic Grill. We are going to serve all the events as we usually do. And we are happy to see you guys. Peace, what it do? Welcome to NYT Comics at 117 Main Street, Dobbs, Surrey, New York. I'm Debo the Pro with my homie. Lee Farley. Welcome to the spot. Specializing in yesterday's and today's comic books, rare CGCs, toys, collectibles. Got skateboards, old school tapes, Magic the Gathering, Warhammer. Video games, original art, original art pieces by your favorite New York City and worldwide artists. Let's go. Skate decks all day, baby. We also have the young reader section here for like 10, 10 and under. Uh, pops. People love the pops. Star Wars. <laughs> We are New York Hardcore. We always rep the scene. Let's get it on. Just get the fuck out of my way today. I am taking no prisoners. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Show number 249. Yes, of course, coming up one week from today is the landmark 250th episode with Lars from Rancid, the old firm Casualties, and Oxley's Midnight Runners. Um, after that, listen, another great drummer, Hail Satan, Abaddon from Venom will be on the show. A little bit after that, uh, DC represent the Slicky Boys, uh, Phil from Violence and Machine Head, uh, shout out to Chris Contos, um, San Francisco Thrash represent, Excited about the three-year anniversary show, Sunday, April 9th, with Moby. I suggest that you check out the punk rock vegan movie that he did that is free on Netflix. It is a great film. It is very good. The first third of it is a very good hardcore punk documentary. Check it out. Sunday, April 16th, Tim Shaw from Ensign, Fuck It, I Quit. Senor Pistachio, who's out on the road with H2O right now, Wednesday, April 19th. Uh, Sunday, April 23rd, Kira from Black Flag, co-hosted by our friend Joel Gauston. And then Sunday, March 7th, Theo from the, from the Lunar Chicks. So that said, I uh, want to mention also, please support the show um, on Patreon. That's how it works. want to shout out uh, a couple of new patrons, Pat Baldwin. Bridget Holmes, and this just in, Jason Banks. So thank you so much uh, for supporting the show. Listen, it's no fucking secret. I do a lot of hard work and a lot of homework to do this show. I'm, I'm able to do that because I'm fortunate that a lot of people like yourself love the show and support the show. I could not do this show without your support. I, I truly mean that. And listen, everybody fucking knows I'm not getting rich doing this, but I love doing it. Uh, you love being a part of it. It's part of our community. Please support the show. If, if, you, if, you, if you love the show, please. Listen, I don't like to be up here fucking shucking and jiving and shilling uh, uh, you know, for, for money, but it's what the show needs to, it, to continue. It does. So if you could get involved in Patreon, I'd appreciate it. There's a PayPal address. Make a contribution if you can. There's also a super chat function right here. If, if uh, When it's question time, if you do a super chat, you know, it comes through in color. I, I can't miss it. And uh, thank you, bro. I appreciate it. You know, uh, Eddie Medina, thank you. And, and, and Coconut Larry. And, and, and thank you, Chris. Uh, and, and thank you, both Chris's. I work hard at this shit. I do it because I love it. And I'm, I'm extremely fortunate that uh, I have a, a fan base and an audience uh, like you. And, and I never take it for fucking granted. You better believe it. I don't. I know what it's like to have nothing. 
I know what it's like to have nothing, then have something, then have nothing again. <laughs> then have something, then have nothing. So I can appreciate it, you know? Thank, thank you, Gertie. Um, you know, there you go. That said, um, that said, let's uh let's clear the deck. There it is. There's there's the Patreon. Please, uh, you know, please, what can I tell you? Um, let's clear the deck. Uh, let's keep it going because you know, we're taking no prisoners today. I want to shout out Paris Mayhew. Um, uh, did the did the agros thing yesterday? Um, the new agros release is, is really great. Uh, go check it out. Uh, that said, it's been it has been a while. Let's bring him on, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages. The one, the only, Sid the Kid. What's up, bro? What's up, Drew? You're back, uh, man. Temporarily, because adulting and yep. just life and work sucks. That's all I can say to that. Yeah. But I'm glad to be here, everybody. And we got a record. Holy shit. Yeah. I I, I uh hold on. Let me find my let me find the album before we nobody except the host and our guest know what we're gonna be talking about today. This is this isn't this is an interesting this is an interesting one. Let let's uh yeah. There, there you go. Everybody's happy to see you, Sid. You know Not about everybody, just a few people. Well, just a few, you know, you know, you sort of planted a flag. Let's bring our guest back on. Uh, Louis Beato. Hey, man. Hey, so hey, let's, Louis, um, how, how, how you doing over there? How, how you, you doing, doing, Sid? Good to see you, bro. I said, uh, I said, Sid, you cleaned up the fucking your background there, huh? Oh, it, you know, this is part of the adult thing sucks. I had to clean the room slightly. What do you, you got? Know? What do you take? Would you take the air conditioner out of the window? Hey. You want to you want to pick up this eight thousand BTU piece of shit up, up five flights of stairs, Drew? It's, no, I don't. But I, no, no. But I'd leave it in the fucking window and freeze my balls off. I don't think so. Freeze your balls off? Wait a second, bro. You live in New York City. It didn't even snow here this winter. It the doesn't draft, get Drew. cold here anymore. The draft. The draft, Drew. Five all flights. Right, all right. You know, it's all this. It's the science thing. It's the science thing. Louis, Louis. By the way, since he moved out of New York. It, it, it doesn't even remember when we were kids, the winters, we'd be like snowstorms and all that. We'd go skitching and everything. Bro, yeah. it, I took my snow shovel out, uh, you know, uh, of Mark Levine's basement and and, 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 and put it in my chair. It didn't even snow once, you know? Not yet. You know, it's that, it's that global warming that's happening, climate yeah, change. Yeah, we, we, we got nothing here in Florida yet. So. <laughs> uh, let's do album of the week, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages. Here it is. Album of the week. Boom. Boom, motherfucker. In interesting. Very, very interesting, Sid. What do you got, Sid? Uh, well, I had to kind of dig a little bit thanks to Louie. He, this is his pick. So, you know, this is something I didn't even know about this band. Honestly, I had to do a little bit of homework. So here it is. This is a band called Trouble out of Chicago. And this is their debut album, which was, I believe, released uh, February of 1984. Actually, no, sorry, March of 1984. Came out on Metal Blade Records. And this is a band called Trouble. And the album is entitled Psalm 9. Now, again, this is something really different. Off the bat, when you hear this record, automatically, you're going to hear traces of Black Sabbath. Automatic. When I gave this a second listen yesterday and even to this morning, I really gave it a more of a deep listen. Definitely. Big time, definitely Black Sabbath meets early vocal styling of Judas Priest. Now, and of course, if you know Judas Priest, you know, you could go back to the very beginning of how, you know, Rob Halford was sound in the very beginning. That's what definitely this band has that major influence. And of course, listening to this, I can see where the early carnivore material itself came from this record itself. Um, even though they've only put out, I believe, two records. Uh, this definitely was a big, big thing back in 1984 because even quote unquote death metal didn't really exist at that time. But then, you know, doom metal was kind of a thing back then because you really just had Venom and then something else here and there. Then you had Slayer and then it just snowballed from there. But this is one of those bands that really did get sl slept on at that specific moment in time. Louis, is this a is this a, a record that resonated with you guys? Can you give us some perspective on it? Yeah, um, you know, we used to 
we used to every Sunday we used to go to uh, Zigzag Records in Brooklyn. Um, we used to go and you know see what was new. You know, Keith would uh, pick up his issue of Kerrang magazine and uh, you know see what new bands were coming out. And this was one I think that Pete actually brought to our attention at first. Um, and I, when I heard it, I, I instantly fell in love with it. It was like, you know, I, I think only two records uh, actually impacted me the, the way this one had. This one and I'd say the first Man of War album, you know, it took me like a week just to flip the record onto side B. I couldn't even bring myself to, it was, you know, just such a great record. But, um, but this record uh, has a lot of twists and turns. It's it's one of those records that have these bone crushing heavy parts where you just like you know grab your head and stick your fingers in your ears so your brains <laughs> don't fall out you know and it's like it just like really hits you between the legs you know and um, the um, what was really cool about them too is uh, something that we actually and I think Pete continued. You know, not so much on the first Carnivore record, but on the second Carnivore record, you know, we did uh, a cover of Manic Depression. Mm -hmm. um, that was um, kind of in style with Trouble. They did uh, the Tales of Great Ulysses. That's right. On this record. I heard, and, I listened to that today. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's like their interpretation of it. And, you know, I, I think Pete was really like, you know, liking that idea of, of like, you know, reserving space on your record for a cover tune that would be not normally heavy. Sure. But, you, but, you know, um, and, um, you know, like Carnivore, this record has like a lot of, like I said, a lot of twists and turns. A lot, a lot of the songs aren't like your basic format. There are so many different parts that could have unto themselves maybe been combined and made a, you know, a, a second album for them. But right. it's like they, they, they kind of put these parts together, you know, into songs. And, you know, I, I think that's what Carnivore did. You know, Pete did a lot with his writing, too. Did you, did you guys ever play with Trouble? No, never met them, never seen them live. It was just one of these bands that, you know, we listened to the vinyl. And um, it really, like, you know, grabbed, you know, to, you know, took hold of it to us. You know, we, it, 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 uh, it's it's so incredible that that music and art in general, it, 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 as we say, the universal language can. You know, they're not from our neighborhood. They're not from anywhere near us. But but they're speaking a language that we understand, we respect, and we love. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it's funny because I I know I I didn't know when uh, you know um, it was a coincidence actually that um, Sid asked me. Uh, to choose a record that would be um, kind of obscure and, you know, not maybe featured on any of your sure. previous uh, shows. And it, I, like I told him, I just, um, um, my friend Joe uh, is posted uh, a post on uh, Facebook about this record being uh, its birthday yesterday. Oh, wow. Uh, it was, it was actually yesterday. Right guess, on. At the, the 11th. Um, that uh, this record for, you know, came out in 84, which was right before Carnivore's first record came out. So um, it, it hit us at, at just the right time. So I had to listen to it because I, I knew we weren't going to be hearing it today and I hadn't heard it in a while. And it just brought me back, you know, it really brought me back to like, uh, you know, these, these memories of hanging out. I remember when one time Pete and I were hanging out in his sister's apartment in Starrett City. And, Starrett um, City. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, we were blasted in, 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 in her apartment. She was on vacation or something. He needed to, I don't know, feed her cats or something. But we were hanging out there and um, listening to this record. And it was, um, that's what we'd do. You know, we would come home from Zigzag with a new record and, like, just sit down and listen to it together. And, you know. Well, we, 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 we've talked many times uh, on the show about how back then, going to a record store like zigzag or, or free being it was like it was like a pilgrimage and, and you'd go on the day when the new releases came out and 
you the album art you, you know you you'd open it up and you you'd look you know there was all sorts of yeah know, it, it was a process you know yeah, it was you know, yeah you know you, you, you it, they it had the inner, there was so much more was an adventure it definitely yeah. was an adventure because you saw something that was so different you were like holy crap and of course yeah. it could have been good or it could have sucked but you notice everything people, but yeah. usually we, we always we eat with our eyes but especially with our ears but when we saw yeah. like these specific record covers they were so different it didn't have to be demonic it didn't have to be disgusting or crazy it was just something if it grabbed your attention yeah. you wanted it you wanted that record you wanted to take it home put it on your record player and just listen to it well well there was there was a there was a code that, that, that no there was there was a um it was like hieroglyphics for for I, I could just speak for myself as a young teenager you look at who produced it and then you sort of connect the dots and go oh this is the guy that produced that the, that band and then you the art and the lyrics and you sort of make connections and and you sort of you you start connecting the dots and go okay they're from this family and this guy and that artwork oh and this record label and mm. and 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 that that was and listen I'm not saying like it's just a different world now I'm not saying it's a better or worse world but this was the world that 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 yeah. that, Louis and I, that Louis and I and a lot of other people that watch the show uh, uh, grew up grew up in yeah. so. So, so there you go. Hey, Sid, thank you, man. Anybody you want to shout out? Well, I just want to say really quickly, there was a little snafu when I looked at the discography. There actually are seven releases that this band put out. So if you like this record, going down the rabbit hole, check out all the other releases they, that they've had. You know, Absolutely. Uh, honestly, and I, I will say it's not really a shout out, but like I wanted to thank Louie and Pete, rest in peace. Carnivore, again, was one of the other bands that were – underground and not everybody knew of this band that decades later are influencing bands today and have been just for that specific the way uh louis would play his drums and just the specific bass tone that pete would play because even there was only a handful of bass players back then that were rocking distortion that hard pete was one and the only other i could possibly think of was rainy from discharge you never at that time especially within metal specifically and unless i could be wrong here you heard a ton of bass players using distortion or just specific pedal effects the way pete did on those first two on those first two releases all right sid You're thank welcome. you buddy uh come back come back soon man all right it's been a while i'll be back sooner than you think kids all Quick right we'll see you, sid. Take care. Sid. okay there you go ladies and gentlemen sid the kid makes a return lou let's talk about this hello hold on sometimes it takes a minute to get to 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 get a bite on it let's talk about this hello <laughs> <laughs> circle of death yeah right uh buffering uh hold on <laughs> let, me, let me try again that's that sucks uh hold on let's well let, let let's let, let let me as as i try to tee it up let's talk about the first carnivore record and uh, hold on, I'm just trying to get the the cover. Hold on, try again. That's what you get for. Uh, let's try again. There it is. Yeah, L let's talk about the first Carnivore record um, that was done with uh, with uh, the first lineup with Keith Alexander. Um, Memories of recording the first Carnival record. Who was involved in the production? Where it was recorded? It was recorded um, Brielle Sound um, in um, was it? Uh, it was in off of Houston Street somewhere. I never uh, heard of this Brielle Sound. Brielle, Brielle Sound. Yeah, it was. I, it was horrible. It was horrible. <laughs> it really was. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, Norman Dunn was the producer. Um, uh, that was uh, Connie Barrett, who, our manager, who uh, <coughs> recommended we use Norman Dunn. Norman Dunn, from what he claimed back in the day, was the one who who designed and installed the sound system at CBGB's. And um, which is which is. A notorious legendary, legendary sound legendary system. Legendary I mean, sounds. Legendary if you wanted sounds. a demo tape, everybody knew you book a gig at, at, at CB's, throw a tape in the board, and you're getting yourself a decent. I could still hear it in my head. 
Like when you walk <laughs> when you walk in through the door, CBGBs, it's like it it down like down at the in a cave. Yeah. And, and I'll never forget that drum sound, that bass drum sound, you know, yeah. of, of CBGBs. You know. Yeah. 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 I was like you. You were, the stage was surrounded with speakers. Sure. Um, the um, the schedule we had was horrible. We. Yeah. Our they must have got a deal on the place. Um, I mean, we didn't have a big budget for the record, so um, we were recording from midnight to 8 a.m. in the morning. Oh, that was our schedule. Oh um, man, it was horrible. Oh. And I was and I was trying to you know hold down a full time job too. So I was like right. going to work after the, after the you know the recording, and then were, were and you were, were you. Were you driving back then? No, I was working in a warehouse then. Oh, okay. okay. So, you know, I, it, it, I mean, in fact, I almost got fired over this record. And I, to, and I, oh. told, the, I told the guy, I told you, the only thing that's going to, you know, interfere with this job is my band. And this right. is, the, I, I told him, like, you know, I was there maybe like a year and a half or something. Um, and, uh, you know, I had the long hair. There's not many jobs you can get looking like that, right? So, you know, here right. I am working in this warehouse, packing orders and stuff. And when the, when the time came to do the record, I gave it priority, you know? So, I mean, I tried to come into work, but it just, I just couldn't keep, keep it up. So I banged out sick a few days and came back and he was like, you know, I, I got to fire you. I was like, well, do what you got to do. But I told you, this is going to interfere. And this is the one time that I uh, can't really, you know, be here. So did you, uh, did you lose, did you lose the job over this? No, not over that. I lost it. <laughs> I lost it a couple, about a year later. Uh, right. th let's put it this way. The day I was getting fired, I, <laughs> I quit because I already got my job with the transit authority. <laughs> there, there you go. There, so there you go. It, it worked out well. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah. So that schedule sucked. And I think, you know, had we had a better schedule, our performance might've been, a little better for it too because you know we were shy you know sure can i read uh let me let me read a little something uh um regarding carnivore's self-titled uh first record heavily influenced by the contemporary new york hardcore scene as well as black sabbath and early judas priest the post-apocalyptic theme that dominated the first album and was carried into parts of the second album was apparently inspired by a dream pete Steele had and which became the basis for the lyrics of predator the first song from the original album. The lyrical theme was then expanded on to describe human society or the lack of one <laughs> between imaginary World Wars three, four, and possibly five as referenced in the song World Wars three and four. Other lyrical themes include nihilism, anti-religious sen sentiment, cynicism, and explicit but tongue in cheek depictions of gore and despair. Song titles such as Jesus, Hitler, Race War, Thermonuclear War, and God is Dead reflect these themes. Hmm. Well, Jesus, Hitler wasn't on that record, though. The, uh, okay. So I don't know where you now, but yeah. okay. Well, any of that ring true? Um, uh, the dream part, uh, maybe. Pete was always, yeah. you know, you know, he had a lot of things going on in his mind. Um, um, but you know, the band was heavily influenced by like uh the mad max road warrior theme like you know that kind of like uh you know life after uh you know you know in the future when there's um no uh no gas you know post post, -apocalyptic. post -apocalyptic. yeah i mean you yeah, know yeah. um it was a it was a really cool um like science fiction or you know uh it, it was just a very um imaginative uh theme to base that first record on mm. and a lot of it was you know um almost like foreshadowing you know a lot mm. of peter's i mean a lot of Pe peter's carnival material uh both both records i feel i have a lot of foreshadowing any any um sort of insight onto this guy's guitar playing uh god rest his soul keith alexander on the first record Keith was fun. I, I thought Keith would, did a, a, a great job on the first record. You know, uh, again, you know, the, a band is more than just the playing. It's, it's, it's the presence. It's, it's like, uh, you know, the whole package, you know, and I mean, look at that picture. <laughs> Keith, 
he looked the part, man. He yeah, was yeah. so he was yeah. such a Neanderthal, you know. He sure. really was. He was sure. And um, and he he had a lot of heart. I mean, he put a lot of heart, a lot of sweat into it. And um, I um, you know, I mean, it, it was kind. I mean, the most challenging part for Keith was you know coming up with leads for the songs because Peter pretty much wrote you know the you know most of the guitar parts um and 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 there was no you know problem with that uh the interpretation that he had to come up with was for, was for leads and um again you know this happened kind of quickly and during the wee hours of the night and um so you know th there wasn't uh i guess enough time for him to really work out and have a solid you know lead so he was kind of doing a lot of trial and error which one sounded best we do different takes or whatever and sure. took the best ones you know um but um now, now was this record produced i mean was there or, or was it, it basically just trying to capture you guys what you do was there anybody like in a producer chair uh, yeah like that was that was norman dunn norman dunn okay yeah um him and pete i mean you know pete um, I think Pete learned a lot from that experience where, uh, I, I think from, 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 I think that was the last record that he relinquished control over like that. You know, I, I think, you know, it was a learning experience for him. I, I think sure. that, you know, you know, sometimes you're not sure if you think, you know, you can handle, uh, uh, you know, you know, maybe someone puts doubt in your mind or something like, you know. You know, oh, we need a producer. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. and then when you realize after the fact, you know, shit, I could have did that. In fact, I think I could have done it better. Sure. As a matter of fact, after the fact, I think uh, we actually tweaked it somewhat. Uh, we weren't complete. See, like I said, the studio had a lot of issues. Norman had to actually recalibrate all their uh, oh, machines geez. to uh, because they were having. Um, sinking issues or something with their sure. studio with the 24 track recording oh you know god what a nightmare so yeah it was so they so like you know not only did we have like you know you know a really horrible schedule but you know <laughs> for the first three or four hours norman was was tweaking and and trying to retune and calibrate their machines so it was it was a real nightmare it wasn't it wasn't great and we were running out of time running out of money uh there were things that you know we were supposed to do uh you know, there's a lot of stuff on that record that, like, he had a hard time getting a good snare sound out of my uh, out of my snare. So he wound up mm -hmm. using a trigger, and what that happened, what that did was every time the 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 mic on the snare picked up any any other you know input, like me clicking the sticks. If you listen to that record, there's times when you hear me counting the band in, and mm -hmm. you, I'm clicking the sticks, and the snare's being triggered. It's mm -hmm. you know, it's it's. Horrible shit like that. That you know, yeah. I can't. I cringe when I hear it. You know, so it's like it's it's like bittersweet when you you know people are praising that record and saying you know what a great record. I mean, yeah, the songs were great. The recording itself, uh, you know, we, it could have been better. Um, it should have been better, but sure. um, but you know, it is what it is. You know, and uh, now, now was it wasn't um, that record? You you weren't you guys signed to? Road Racer, yes. Now Road Racer later morphed into Road Runner. Well, yeah, Road Racer was. Now, the I'm just asking, how did the Road Racer deal come? Because I, I do believe they were European based. How did right. they how did they come into the orbit of a bunch of guys from Brooklyn? Uh, again, it was Connie Barrett who had uh, that connection, and the infamous she... Connie Barrett. Yeah, she um, she uh, I guess initiated that uh, introduction to to the label. Um, and I remember it was funny because we were um, waiting on a decision at uh, in the lawyer's office. Uh, I remember it was Keith, Peter, and I, and um, it was actually dependent on input from King Diamond, who was mm -hmm. on the label. Yeah. The label was called Roadrunner in Europe, but the American uh, part of it was called Road Racer, I guess. Got it. For whatever licensing sure. reasons, whatever. Sure. 
Um, but it was um, King Diamond uh, was, uh, we were waiting for King Diamond's opinion about the demo tape uh, to reach the lawyer's office on, as to whether or not we were going to sign this deal. And we signed the deal, you know, um, we got it. You know, we didn't even really, you know, like, like any young band, you know, we were just excited to have a record deal. We didn't realize how shit it was, you know. Like Michael LaRoche says, wasn't Roadrunner known for shitty contracts? Well, just real quick, I think for the most part, in, in that moment, bands that, whether it's, you know, that's kind of the shitty contract that was put in front of everybody. Yeah. Nobody, no band that was at your level at that moment is handed some sort of amazing. Yeah, exactly. yeah. right. Let's be realistic, world. Right. You know. Yeah. It wasn't until like I, you know, I, it, it, later on when Peter was still obligated to Roadrunner legally, that's right. That, that yeah. they, they were able to negotiate things differently. Um, you know, Peter was just like, and, and I, they and they had him. They had him hooked because you yes. guys signed as Carnivore with Roadrunner Road Racer. So when he formed Typo Negative, they still had his claws in him. Because we were all jointly and severally obligated. That's right. To the, uh, to, I remember that terminology. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> joint, joint. So, so uh, yes, Paul Stone. Every label ha ha has has you know that that shitty that shitty contract. And, and, and I will say this, uh, having some experience in this realm and uh, being a bit of a former manager, a lot of bands sign that shitty record deal, including Metallica, including, you know, including a lot of bands, including a, a lot. There's a bevy of bands. But, but what, what happens is that bands put in the work, put in the years, and eventually work their way out of it and renegotiate. It's not a death sentence. You know, a lot of bands are, oh, you know, we signed the shitty record deal. Yo, there's there's a lot of bands that did the hard work and, and worked their way out of it and, 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 and worked their way through it. Uh, how about Life of Agony? You know, eventually Typo Negative, uh, Biohazard or whatever. Like bands, so it's not, you know, people think it, it's not a death sentence, uh, but bands, when, when bands fail, they like to always put it on. It was the label, the shitty label of the manager. You know, it, well, it's, I, I will say this, though, about Roadrunner that they, you know, there were other la like um, at the time, I guess, like the comparable label was Megaforce Records, you know, that's right. That's and right. Megaforce seemed a lot more of a stand up um, label to be on. They, they, supported and they were local. Bands. They were local. They supported their bands. They gave tour support. Carnivore never got any tour support. Right. They, we, you know, we, we put the record out. And then, like, you know, we played a few local shows. I mean, we never got off the block, basically. We would, we stayed in the tri-state area, you know, and, um, you know, we're getting older. You know, life responsibilities are uh, starting to, you know, to, you know, haunt us. And um, you start making, you know, needing to make decisions on, you know, what you're going to do with yourself, you know. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if we got tour support, um, you know, and what is tour support? Tour support is still money that the record label gets back with the recouping of, 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 of that money from the record sales. It's, it's all recoupable. You're basically taking a loan from the record company so you can go support something that's going to make them rich. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's all, it's all recoupable. And, and that's, and that's, uh, that's something that a lot of bands don't understand early on. They think, hey, it's it's the, the, the record company's spending money on us. La 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 la. I managed bands back in the day. And and bands, a lot of band members are so foolhardy that they believe that, you know, the record company's giving us money. Record company's not giving you shit. Right. It's all it's all recoupable. All of it is recoupable. You know, the 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 tour support the music video money the fucking uh the, the, ev everything everything that they they give you here here's a, you talk about uh you know doing local shows here, here's a great one uh from back in the day with uh carnivore and venom and overkill at, at, at the ritz you know yeah yeah it's yeah. funny this this one always kind of like is a sore spot with me it, it reminds it? me yeah because uh you know I mean, when you see this, you look at it and you think, okay, you know, Venom is the headliner. 
yeah. you got to overkill and carnivore, you know, as a supporting act so one day and call maximum fortified the next. So, you know, we spoke before about the importance of uh, me playing on my drums and being lefty and this and that. When we did this show and uh, Venom did their sound check and now uh, Overkill is doing their sound check. After they did their sound check, they just left their shit on stage in front of Venom's drums. And I had literally like six feet between the drum riser of Overkill and, and, and the front of the stage. I was like, no, this ain't going to work. You got to take, take your drums down. I'm like, oh, we're not taking the drums down. I was like, well, you got to take them off the drum ride. I got my own drum ride. And at the time, it was uh, Rat Skates was the drummer. Right. And he had a real fancy schmancy drum riser that had these, like, you know, hydraulic, like, scissor thing that opened it up. You know, my drum riser was, you know, uh, plywood and, and, and milk crates held together with C clamps, you know. Uh, every show, we'd go out and steal milk crates for more bombs and then just dump them at the end of the night and right. do that every show. Go, so, pull anyway, around, pull around the back. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. uh, I was like, well, either move your drum riser and let me put my milk crates up or I have to set up on your drum riser. And they were like, no, no, we're not, you know. And I was what like, the well, fuck did they expect you to do? I was like, well, there's no fucking way. I just started taking the drums down. I was like, there's no fucking way. I, you know, we're, we're, you know, I, I, you know, I'll tell you one thing that I loved about when you know and maybe i'm getting ahead of this conversation but we talk okay. about crossover and talk about you know metal versus hardcore and punk metal tend to be more like prima donnas hardcore were more you know uh, you know down to earth down to like you know give you the shirt off their back kind of people you know sure and and i, and I, I you know that was so um refreshing Cause that's what we were. We were more like that. You know, we were friendly. You worked with us. We, you know, we open arms, you know, we, you know, we love, you know, we, we never pulled that rock star bullshit with anybody. That happened to us one time when we played with Raven, same thing. And Lamore played with Raven and Raven had their fucking drum riser and ramps and this and that. And they didn't make any fucking, you know, they didn't, you know, want to move anything for us to play. And, um, so Keith started using the ramps while we were playing. He started using Raven's ramps, going up and down the ramps. And and I remember Rob Wacko Hunter was shaking his fist at Keith from backstage. And Keith turns around and gives him the finger and was yeah. like, like, you know. And as soon as the last chord played, Keith ripped off his guitar and like fucking body slams Wacko. Like fucking, they just had a brawl at it. You know, they were like, you know. Wow. And um, it was a mad fight that happened. And then... Um, I remember Johnny's in, in, in where else but Lamar. Lamar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's so uh, great, you know, so, so fucking great. And Johnny Z was there and he sent us a case of beer. He apologized for them because they were being assholes. They were, you know, you, you don't forget where you came from. Come on. Yeah. How do you, you know, how do you do that? You know, I, you, you know, I don't know. It, so, it just never sat well with me. So, so that really, thank you for the segue. Uh, and, and you mentioned Connie Barrett. And another band that Connie Barrett was managing at the time was, of course, Agnostic Front. Yep. And after Agnostic Front did the uh, Victim of Pain record, uh, it was a time of transition. And uh, soon after, uh, they were working towards their next record, and they, need, and they needed a drummer. And you guys had the same managers, I believe. And I'm assuming that's where the call came from for you to step in and play drums on this iconic album could you tell us about it oh yeah that was great i mean that was such a uh you know uh i couldn't believe it. i couldn't believe i had the opportunity to play with you know with was new york's premier hardcore punk band you know and um i remember talking to roger about it um you know saying you know i i'm a, i'm a metal drummer basically i mean you know i don't you know i mean we have some faster songs, but you know, he's like, no, that's what I want. I, I want, I want you to put as much double bass as you can. I want you to, you know, <laughs> I want you to really just do what you do and, and bring that element into it. You know, gotta love, like, gotta love Roger. Yeah. I was like, fuck yeah, man. Like, you know, some other ones, I, I can do my own thing 
yeah. on your record and and this is what you're looking for right and like yeah, yeah. man and um yeah, yeah it, it was it was really cool that's when um we started rehearsing with um with them we had a spot um in brooklyn that we started renting uh, it was like our own space we were able to keep our own gear in and um we uh, we invited them to come and practice uh you know working on this on this record at, at our at our studio so like we would have a carnival rehearsal um actually we were doing carnival auditions mm. <laughs> i remember when when we actually got mark this kind of segues into when mark got into the band because That's right. Mm -hmm. because um we just finished auditioning mark and we were blown away by mark when and he um auditioned and um he um uh i remember Vinny stigma was like that's your new guitarist and i said yeah why would he goes he's like what happened to keith keith was like big you know you look like a gorilla you know this this guy look at him whoa he's like, he's like, he's like, oh. like you know, i was like well you know maybe we're not doing that like you know we might not do the the, the caveman look anymore i don't well, we're know making, we're mixing it up a little bit yeah you know things change man you know yeah. <laughs> but uh it was a very cool time i was that was like when i was probably in my prime because i was practicing with you know both bands at the same time you know i um in doing my homework for this show i i re-listened to this record and uh you know with with the nice uh you know i i pod earbuds and and i, I gotta say I, i've never heard this record sound so good and at, at this at this stage uh i have the ability uh thankfully doing a show like this that, you know, I, I go back when I have a guest like you and I listen to something like this a little bit differently now. You know what I mean? I, I'm listening to it a little bit differently. When this record came, when this record came, when this record first came out, it wasn't, it, 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 I don't want to say it went over my head, but I was in a different place in, in my life. You know, I was, I was a New York hardcore kid. You know, I was a hardcore dude. I, I think I, a lot. I think a lot of pit fans were disappointed with this record yeah. because it kind of took their, you know, the, it, it, it deviated from, from what yeah. they were doing, you know, and, uh, you know, it was almost like, you know, and it was like, and Roger's attitude about it was like, well, f well, fuck that, you know, we, we're, you know, this is, we're evolving. This is what, you know, yeah, we're, 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 we're doing something different here. Got, got to give it up for Roger, man. Uh, ha ha having that vision because I remember buying it and listening to it and being very disappointed and, and sort of putting it in the collection, put, putting it, 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 putting it away. You know, I, I wanted, I wanted Victim in Pain. You know, too. You know, that right. that Victim in Pain was such a, a landmark record, uh, s such such a landmark record. And yes, Chris Contos, you know, uh, from the Boneless Ones and and formerly uh, and Machine Head says, yeah, I wasn't ready for crossover. It, you know, I I I wasn't that guy at the, at that time when this stuff. You know, I was. I was deep in the hardcore stuff and, and, and that's, that's where my heart was at the time. Now, like I said, fortunately, and, and not just lately, but, but, you know, I, music has been my life and my, in, in my, my career for a long time, but, you know, I listened to this again with, you know, with a different perspective um, and it's never sounded so good. Uh, I listened to it, you know, the last couple of days and your drumming, uh, the production, the whole thing, Roger's vocal delivery, you know, it is a really outstanding, outstanding record. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I'm, I'm happy with this one. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I have, uh, if, if you could see uh, in the, in the background here uh, was a gift from Howie Abrams and that's the, uh, an original uh, advertisement uh, for, for this record yeah. That, yeah. That, that is, that is signed that he gave to me as a birthday gift uh signed by signed by uh signed by sean taggart i know that um a couple of years later which is almost almost 10 years later and we spoke about this and you were kind enough uh to talk about this in the new york hardcore chronicles film uh you guys played the black and blue bowl and 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 this lineup that did this this record uh got back together and you played two nights can you tell us about this experience a little bit yeah, it was um, uh, the, the the record was inducted into Decibel Magazine's Hall of Fame. Right. And there was a whole article on on the record, uh, and um, I, you know, 
primarily recognizing its um, relevance in the crossover uh, uh, music that was happening at that time. And um, Roger actually thought that it'd be cool to uh, see if we can get everybody together for a reunion of the Cause for Alarm lineup to do a show. And he thought a good opportunity would be at the Black and Blue. Um, so it was like February before uh, this, the show was in May. So I remember it was February. We got together for the first time. Uh, Roger wasn't at the initial rehearsals, but we got together, uh, Vinny, uh, Kabula, and um, um, good Lord, I'm forgetting his name. <laughs> Alex. Alex. Alex, Alex, Alex Kynan. Yeah. Alex Kynan, yeah. Um, yep. We um, got together in a studio, ran down the songs, you know, and um, it wasn't horrible. I mean, it wasn't great, but it wasn't horrible. And um, who, 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 who was, who like, who was the musical director of that? Was there somebody leading the charge? Um, you mean when the record was being created? No, no, no. When you guys got back together to rehearse for these shows, did, was somebody, I mean, there had to be, was there anybody that was sort of. I, well, I mean, I, I booked at the studio and I okay. initially, um, yeah. it was, you know, um, no one really was in no one was ever really in charge when it came to agnostic yeah. front, you know, very, very casual, you know, uh, approach to things. Um, right. I remember though, once we started a, um, a, a rehearsal schedule, we, we, uh, practiced that, um, a space that Kabula had in, in Jersey. In, in Clifton, um, in Clifton. Yeah. 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 I know, I, I know the place. Yeah. The yeah. So, uh, the way we worked it out is we practiced every Friday night, uh, Vinny, would meet me at work and uh then we'd ride the ferry over to staten island get in my car where i parked it and then wow. drive up to rehearsal so wow that's awesome kind of cool it was it was very cool having Vinny stigma in my office you know yeah was like you people don't even know who this is you know <laughs> 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 but they got to know him. you know Vinny. he doesn't you know he's not a shy guy so yeah. Of course, he got to know them and everybody loved them, you know? Very personable guy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it is. Yeah. It, 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 yeah. I, I, I reached I, out to a guy that, uh, you know, was a printer and uh, he made up uh, the drum heads for the show. Yeah. It was that, that, that was a great bill, man. Those, the, I, I look, looking back uh, on the black and on, on all the black and blue bowls, that was one of the greatest um, years. Those two shows outdoors at the well. Um, yeah. I think one night Hatebreed headline, the other night was a discharge headline. Yeah. And, and you guys were in direct support both nights. You guys were, you guys were, you guys, you guys were good the first night, great the second night. Yeah. It was the warm up show. Yeah. 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 It kind of, cool. it, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's funny. You know, I mean, there's, you know, you know, I, I, one thing I'll say about all the guys that, um, were from the neighbor, the biohazard, uh, yeah. typo negative, all my boys, all people that, yeah. you know, tight friends with that, that, that toured extensively, you know, that mm -hmm. became seasoned, became, you know, developed muscle memory in their playing. I mean, I, I, I never had that opportunity. I, yeah. I, you know, I would have yeah. loved to have been able to, get to that level of playing. I mean, sure. I had the ideas, you know, but let's face it, you know, you do a one, you know, you haven't played, God, when was the last time I played? That was 2014. The last time I played was with Pete when we played uh, the Milwaukee Metal Fest in 1998, okay? Yeah. So you're talking yeah. like, you know, almost 20 years later, sure. I'm on a stage after a few rehearsals, your heart's pumping, you're like, yeah. you know, you know, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's nerve wracking, you know, sure, sure. <laughs> until you That's get a few of them under your belt, you know, and you, then you start getting, even doing this show, I was like, you know, a little, you know, humming, humming, humming. Well, you know, we, it, you know once, it, once it gets going here, you, <laughs> you know, it, it, um, one thing you shared with me when, when, when I interviewed for the film was it was such a, um, great opportunity and you cherished it because it was a chance for your family to, 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 to see something like that. Absolutely. Which it was really, really cool. Really, really great. Yeah, you know? Yeah, that was great. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. 
Um, you know, one of my favorite, and you, you, you touched on Mark Pivanetti, and uh, I'm digging out. I, I think it could be my all-time favorite um, carnivore photo. You know, <laughs> this is my favorite all-time carnivore photo right here. It, it just says it all, man. You know, Peter always had to get that Nathan shot in. <laughs> he, he loved Nathan's. Um, just... <laughs> yeah. yeah. And of course we ate, you know, we didn't just go to there to take a picture. Of course right. we stopped to eat, you know, everywhere right. we go, we would have to eat. Yeah. This is another one where just, just the expression on your faces, it's no. just, it, it, and then, and then, you know, if if you if if you are a sort and of and I'm always smiling in the pit. These other guys are always trying to look tough. I'm like I'm just yeah. happy to be here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and these those these those photos, which which Richard shot, is a bunch. There's a there's a lot of them out there from that photo session. Here's here's another one from uh you know right around the right down the block. Right. Yeah, these ones were not Richard though. Those ones were we actually that was a uh, uh, Bonnie something or other. I forget her name. No, no. Bonnie. I, thought, I thought Rich. Okay. Yeah, look on the bottom. It says it. Uh, there, there you go. This Bonnie is... Graham. Ah. Okay. Bonnie Graham. Yeah, you yeah. got this one. Yeah. Oh, let me see. Hold on. Hold on. Let's see. There you go. Yeah, I got that. Some. Yeah. 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 That's what that's in my garage. That's Lenny and John's. <laughs> that's Jack Daniels and Pizza. That's yeah, there Lenny, you go. Lenny and John's. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> that's great. Um, so and, and this is you know, this screams carnivore, screams New York, you know, in, in, in front of in front of the 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 infamous infamous cyclone. cyclone. Yeah. Um Mark Mark enters the picture. And uh, you record this. Um, now, I, I mean, we don't have to do a deep dive, but Keith leaves the band. Mark joins. Uh, why did Keith move on? Uh, I hate talking about this. <laughs> okay, I, keep it simple. Um, keep it simple. Is, um, it, is there a way to keep it simple? I... I don't know. I don't think so. Um, it's, it's a sore subject, you know. Again, you know, there were two sad, very sad moments in my brief music career, and that's when Fallout broke up, and uh, the second was when when Keith left the band. Um, um, you know, um, Peter wasn't easy to be in a band with, honestly. I mean, mm -hmm. he was a – I mean – Peter made me the drummer I am because he he wrote stuff that required or left room for very challenging, um, you know, uh, applications for the drums. So sure. it, it was, you know, and I always welcomed the challenge. I always, you know, embraced it and wanted to conquer it. Um, and maybe Keith wasn't able to in Pete's eyes. Let's just say that. And um, so, um, again, you know, it was one of those things that um, happened. And um, did, did uh, they butt heads? Did they butt heads a lot? They butted heads. Yeah, you know, uh, you know, P uh, Peter and 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 Keith both had very um, thick heads, mm. very you know, strong personalities. Sure, and you know. You know, when Carnivore initially uh, started playing, um, you know, Peter didn't want to be the, the, the mouthpiece on stage. He just wanted to sing the songs and he wanted to shy away from interaction with the audience. So Keith kind of provided that role on stage. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so he became a significant personality at our live shows. And, um, you know, when... Um, when Keith was no longer in the band, now that that you know that 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 role laid more on, on Pete, and I'm not sure if it was that maybe, you know, Peter became more comfortable on stage and and 
decided, you know, he didn't need someone to play that role anymore. I don't know. Um, but uh, it, it was it was not, uh, not, you know, not a happy moment, really. Um, I'm, but, I'm you know, uh, but the good part is that when we did um, meet Mark, he uh, had a very positive musical contribution to the band. Um, and, 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 uh, and there is there is a bit of a musical sort of metamorphosis between the two records. Absolutely. And absolutely. I think that's, and that's why, like, it, it kind of we evolved. You know, uh, yeah. we had we had a completely different look with Keith in the band. Sure. Um, you know, and with Mark, we we uh, changed it into just, you know, street attire, you know, yeah. urban urban youth or whatever you want to call it, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, everything kind of changed. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, there were people who love retaliation who really d don't like the first carnival record. Uh, right. You know, um, I, um, I mean, I, mean, I, 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 I got to say that just in my world, to me, it was all, it was, it, it, it was part of the same thing to me. It, it was like, to me, it was part of the, the same category. Part of the reason, and I know we're jumping ahead, is because I think a CD was put out with them both on it, right? It, was it was there a CD with both records on it, first and second record, like two for one, a road racer thing? And I, I remember for some, that was I, the, I think you're talking about the Price Killers one yeah. at, the, at the CD, but I, yeah. I, I don't think I don't know if they were if they're both. I don't know, you know. <laughs> I, I'm not sure, Drew. Yeah, I'll be honest yeah. with you. But um, but but go but go, I, all I'm saying is that for me, that it was part of the same sort of this is carnival. Both records sort of were were a bit intertwined. Uh, but that said, go on. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. It's um, it's it's like I said, this this record uh, um allowed, I think, Peter to to write. Um, more challenging parts, you know, for guitar and and for drums. I mean, I think the, sure. the, the drum parts were were um, really interesting too. And 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 uh, I mean, we had some we had some really cool pieces in this on this record. I mean, polyrhythms going on. I mean, we yeah. <laughs> we had we had a lot of a lot of good stuff um, on this record. Um, yeah. And um, you know, we had more money for it too. I mean, not a lot more, but we had more money. We had a, a a, I think a better producer. We had Alex Perry Alice produce this record. Right. Um, we, we, uh, we recorded it under our terms at Systems Two. Did Did Alex produce the Cause for Alarm record as well? No, Norman did that one. No, right. No. Right. I'm sorry. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Got it. Yeah. Um. Right on. That and uh, here's a here's a great kind of live shot from the carnivore uh mark ii era um this looks like the ritz in new york yeah because yeah. Yeah, i see some familiar faces uh uh about bouncing there but yeah and, and i saw you play the i saw carnivore play the ritz um i i i, I think twice I, I so i remember yes big big charlie and yes people are people are saying i i, I am correct yeah that there was a a two for one uh, CD and and that was sort of my introduction. So to me, it was I, I didn't know where one ended and the other started. So it was just as many Carnivore tracks that fit on eighty an eighty minute CD, you know. So that was yeah. yeah. So so that was my, my 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 part of it. So 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 that said, uh, the the uh, retaliation gets done and you guys are are out playing. And did did Carnivore ever like get out of town to play? Did Carnivore ever like go like play Boston or play DC or anything like that? We played DC once. Uh, <laughs> once. We, yeah. We played a place. Um, we played a place that used to be a bank. I don't know the name of it. I don't know. I don't know where it was, Crazy. Um, but that's as, that, that's as, I mean, when we were uh, an intact band, we did yeah. go on the road after, you know, there were, several carnivore reunion shows that we did after yeah. uh we disbanded or whatever after typo negative became yeah, an yeah. Item. and um that's uh, the most extensive tour we did was for one week um 
we we started out um, at Wetlands and worked our way up to the Milwaukee Metal Fest, playing shows in between in Allentown, sure. Pennsylvania. We played in Cleveland. Um, uh, how much? I think maybe four or five shows we played, and um, that's the Carnivore tour, <laughs> the only tour that we ever did. You know, one thing we, we, we'd be amiss not to speak about, um, you know, this is uh, the infamous negative night with Carnivore, Sheer Terror, and Biohazard. And, and of course, this is at Lemoore's, uh, Lemoore. Um, could you give us a little take on Lemoore and, and what Lemoore meant to Carnivore and, and, and your career? Well, that's where it all started for us. Um, I think what put us on the map was... Um, a battle of the bands that happened there. And um, we were um, up against the, uh, well, we're up against several bands. And then it came down, it, it turned out where they had several battles. Uh, and um, we won one battle. This band Disciple uh, won another battle. And then we had a, a battle between Disciple and Carnivore. So there was a lot of, um, you know, a lot of appearances at, at, at Lemoore during that, that whole process. <clears throat> and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that kind of like put us on the, on the Brooklyn map, you know, that got us uh, known for, um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but, um, and then after that, um, we venture out to like Jersey um, you know what? There were shows. I, I, it's like all a blur to me. It's yeah. such a long time ago that I can't even remember a lot of the shows that we played, but, um, here's, you know. here's, here's another, here's another, I, I, I just on the, on the Lamore tip, here's Carnivore and Manowar. I mean, yeah. it, it just seems like when, when I, and I think a lot of other people think of Carnivore, the next thought is Lamore. Yeah, or Man of War. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, a lot of people like you know. I mean, I mean, it was, it was inevitable that uh, I think that uh, Carnivore eventually play with Man of War, especially as we were gaining popularity in the local circuit. You know, um, but uh, we loved Man of War. We, you know, I, we, we um, I don't think we were like influenced them like by them like musically too much, but um, definitely one of. A, one of my favorite bands. Um, yeah. I mean, they had it all. I mean, they had a vocalist with, with range that was incredible. Yeah, you uh, could say he was they, great. They were heavy. They were loud. I mean, it was it was, you know. Yeah. Here's here's another one. Uh, this was uh, 1989, I believe. This is another uh, flyer from uh, from Negative Night. Hold on. Uh, Haven again. We're going a little long, Louis. So if if you have to tap out, just give me give me a five minute notice. You know. No, all right, I got a little time. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm looking doing... for a I'm looking for a shirt here that I I have my bag of tricks here. Yeah, yeah. I'm please, to... any anything you have standing by, feel free to pull it out at any time. You know. I have a I have a shirt that was like. Uh, what do you What do you uh, got? specific for a valentine day show that we did right it was uh <laughs> and, we, and we made you know i mean you don't really yeah i think this is it there we go what do you got 1983 okay so here how many times you see a shirt that has a specific date of a show wow right saint valentine's day massacre reunion wow. february 12th 1994, Lemoore, Brooklyn. And I had the, you know, this it was a good shirt. I had this on the, I don't know, can nice. you see that? And then, you, and then you got this on the back, which yep. was the inner sleeve artwork that Sean Taggart did. Wow. You That's know? That's great. Hey, you know, um, I want to bring a friend of ours on who, uh, who co-hosts uh, with me now and then. He's a drummer. He's known for his work. Uh, with uh, uh, Electric Frankenstein. He was in Pig Face, friends with the Misfits. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Joel Ghostin. Hey, buddy. Hey, how are you, Drew? 
I, I, I'm good. I know uh, you were excited about Louis coming on the show. And, uh, you know, you asked, it, you know, I wanted you to come on. You, you told me how he uh, was an influence on you. And I just thought it would be great to have you on and, and to sort of uh, tell us yourself. So go ahead. Great, man. Well, first of all, Drew, thank you for giving me some time on the show. My pleasure. I've just been sitting back here listening to it, and it's probably my favorite episode I've seen of the entire series, man. It's, Louie, it's great that you're finally on the show. Um, thank you. Nice to meet you. Yeah, likewise. And it's an honor. And I think it was probably close to two years ago I was talking to Drew. I'm like, you got to get Louie on the show. He's the guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but I wanted to tell you real quick. Um, you know, as Drew mentioned, I'm a drummer and um, I play sometimes in this industrial band called Pig Face, um, which is kind of an offshoot of Ministry, Nine Inch Nails and a couple of other bands. And back in 2016, I was asked by the leader of that band to come back and do a 25th anniversary reunion show at the House of Blues in Chicago. Uh, which, of course, I agreed to because it was such a great gig. But the problem I had was I hadn't sat behind a drum kit for eight years at that point. You know, I was busy raising a kid and doing what, you know, one does at a certain point mm -hmm. in life. So I'm like, cool, I've got this show in like a month, but I can't get my head around a drum kit, you know. So I did what i had already done for years in the past i went to that cause for alarm record for inspiration so my regiment was warming up to a lot of your tom fills on that album and it kind of became my rocky training montage leading up to that gig in chicago so um that playing helped me to remember what it was like to feel like a drummer Wow. Yeah. So fast forward a few weeks, I'm on stage in front of 2000 people in Chicago, went off without a hitch that led to playing in London and doing, you know, really cool things that I didn't expect to have happen at this point in my history as a drummer, because I had set it aside for a bit. So um, you have my gratitude. Well, I know exactly what that feels like having putting, you know, drumming aside. But I guess, you know, you'll agree, too, that you never really lose it. I mean, yeah, yeah, it, you know, it's it's there. It's just a matter of um, finessing it and getting, you know, getting back that muscle memory. Right. And um, it's, um, you know, Drew has been trying to get me on the show for a while. And, and again, you know. I'm so far removed from anything that's happening right now, but you know, he, he has been telling me and I've been watching some of the other recorded shows that he has and seeing some comments about people. And, you know, I'm on Facebook and I have people that, you know, reach out to me occasionally and have good sentiment. And I mean, it's, it's incredible to think that, you know, you had impact on people like that. And I appreciate it. I really do. Yeah, well, I, I, I appreciate you, and I will say with a full heart, truly, you are the Bill Ward of hardcore. That's so nice. Thanks. Oh. Thanks, Joel, bro. Um, appreciate it, man. Thank Thanks for your heartfelt Thank you so comments. much. Very nice. Thank we'll you. talk to you soon, man. All Take right? care, guys. Thank you. All right. Take care. Well, shit, now I'm all fucked up. Oh, fuck. <laughs> Unbelievable. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> Woo. Well, I'm, Damn. All, I'm all fucked up now. Man, you had to do that, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. You yeah. Know? Yeah, man. It's you know, something he else. He reached out to me and he told me this story. And, I, and, and, uh, and he beautiful. said, if it's not too much trouble, you know, could, could I say hi to Louie and tell him how much? And I said, yeah, man. That's we'll, 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 that's we'll, right. Thank you for that. I, I yeah. appreciate it. I really yeah, don't. my my pleasure. Um, so move, move, <laughs> incredibly move, moving forward. Um, so Carnivore Mark II, Mark Piavinetti, you do the record. Why did Carnivore, after a couple years after that, why did Carnivore sort of uh, let me use the term take a hiatus? I mean, why did Carnivore sort of stop playing uh at, at that point? Uh, 
Well, um, the, the reason that comes to my mind is that uh, we were working on a third record. Ah. And um, at that time, Peter was working at the Parks Department. Um, I was working for New York City Transit. Um, and um, we were trying to make this thing work while, um, you know, doing uh, our full-time jobs. And discussions about how, you know, are we going to be able to support this record? Are we going to be uh, out, uh, you know, uh, going on tour? How are we going to balance that with our work schedules and stuff? You know, we're both fairly new on our jobs. We didn't have vacation stacked up yet. To, right, uh, right. So it was, um, it was difficult um, to, to really uh, think about how that was all going to play out. Sure. And, um, you know, so in my mind, the, the, the record needed to be strong enough to kind of support itself and, uh, you know, like be able to uh, maybe get some airplay, uh, you know, um, kind of sell itself in a sense, rather than having to go out and support it and try to, you know. Sure. And, um, you know, Peter had a direction that the, the record, you know, that the, the, the content was going in that I just think didn't really, wasn't going to, you know, provide that, you know, that possibility. And um, I had, you know, reservations about, and, and, you know, first and foremost, you know, I think what, Pete and I had in our relationship was a, we had a tighter friendship than we had. I mean, you know, we worked well together musically. Um, Peter, you know, wrote what I wanted to play to. And it was like, uh, you know, it, it was, it, it just meshed really well, you know. Um, occasionally he had specific, uh, you know, things he wanted to hear in the song. Um, but pretty much, you know, like I said, we were able to jam together. We were able to, you sure. know, so we, we meshed. Um, so there was no problem there. But throughout those years that we were together, we, we became really good friends, too. Of course. So Some, sometimes this happens in bands. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls out there, when you're in a band with someone, you actually develop a really, really uh, – close friendship with, 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 cause you know, we all hear about bands and now, you know, things always go in, in, in that, but sometimes things happen differently. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. um, you know, you know, I, 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 I would like to think that we, you know, we put our friendship first before, before, you know, anything would interfere with that. Right. So it was kind of time to just like, you know, we had our musical differences as they say, I sure. guess, you know, and, um, you know, considering, you know, that there were already obstacles in front of us for, you know, uh, supporting this record and uh, me not feeling completely supportive of the material that, that, that it was um, uh, going, that direction it was going in, it, it was time what to Was just... the lineup, was the lineup the same? Was it you? Yeah, it was, yeah, it was Mark. And actually, Mark, at this point, you know, you know, I give Mark a lot of credit because, you know, at this point, Mark was like, what the fuck? Peter's got a job. Louie's got a job. What about me? You know, I, I'm right. still, I want I still want to play. So Mark actually um, explored uh, and got into, uh, was working with the crumb suckers. That's right. Okay. So um, he kind of had something on the back burner, you yeah. know, and um, you know, so that's kind of just how it ended. I mean, you know, we, you know, decided that. Um, it was, what was it? Was it sort of a set thing? Like you it was had mutual. That, that it, final it, conversation? Like, yeah, hey, absolutely. I love you, bro. Let's absolutely. take it. It was yeah. good. It was all good, Drew. That's I mean, good, man. Because, it's and, not, it's nice you, to hear that. No, it was good. It was all good because, um, I mean, even, and then when, you know, when typo negative form, when they were repulsion, when they were. Sure. Uh, sub zero, you know, all the names they yeah. went through first, you sure. know, and sure. whatever they were doing. I mean, you know, it was like, it was very carnival like, of course. In fact, they played shows, they played carnival songs at their shows because people knew Pete from carnival more than they did, you know, repulsion or typo negative or whatever. So, 
What, um, wasn't wasn't some of the material uh, on slow, deep, and hard? Wasn't some was some of that like uh, yes. car, was that the carnivore material you guys were working on? Yes, the yeah. music was the music. Sure. Yes, not yeah. the lyrics, the music. Yep. So, yes, uh, yes, Pat Baldwin. Yes, it, 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 he asked the question. Did that some of it ended up bubbling absolutely. up? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, but that happened throughout a whole you know sure. a whole career. With uh, I mean. Peter had songs. Uh, there's a song. <laughs> I mean, Peter was the first one to admit that he, you know, rip off other, uh, uh, you know, great bands like Black Sabbath. I mean, sure. uh, Jesus Hitler was uh, right. w- was uh, <laughs> Iron Man. Right. I mean, you think about it, it's Iron Man. You know, Iron Man goes dan 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 dan. Right. Jesus Hitler is. Down, 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 down. <laughs> it's, it, it's Iron Man, you know, uh, just a different, you know, interpretation of it. There, but are, no origi- was- there are no original ideas, as Frank Zappa said. Yeah, you there, know, was, yeah. there was one original idea, and everything is sort of a variation of that. Yeah, you know, you know I mean, you know, even when you don't think you're ripping something off, you subconsciously you are, you know. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Because, so, you, you know, it's incredible if you're a musician. There's only so many notes on, uh, you know, there's only so many notes on the scale and you're doing stuff. And then you, you hear another bit who did almost the same thing at the same time. It, it, it's, 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 uh, it's, it, it's very, it's, it's very similar to that. Um, before we, before we take a break, a, a, a quick break, and we'll come back and take some questions. I want, I want to talk about this real quick. And, and this was a show that I was at. Um, this was a carnivore a reunion show. Um, I think it, I think uh, it was like 1995 or, or 94, 93, 94, 95, um, and, and this was at the um, at the uh, at the Grand, which was the Cat Club uh, b- b- before that. And um, it says carnivore uh, last time ever only area appearance. Now I guess. A couple years later, you guys sort of said, "Hey, you know, there's an interest. Uh, let's let's play every now and then." Was, was it, did you, it, it at that point? First of all, I don't even remember this show. <laughs> oh, oh, I do, I do, and I have a story. Okay, but um, uh, yeah, I mean, um, you know, you know, Peter realized that there's still a, uh, you know, you know, here's the thing, carnivore didn't have a big fan base until typo negative hit, hit the circuit. Sure. You know, a lot, sure. It, 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 it exposed a lot of people to, to carnivore. Yeah. So when, um, you know, when, when they became popular to the point where they no longer were playing carnivore songs, people, people, people doubled back to, to look at. The yeah. yeah. So, sure. so Peter realized that there was a market for it and, you know, whenever there was an opportunity for, uh, you know, a break in their schedule, sure. he would say, you know, he would contact me and Mark and say, you know, I'm going to be back uh, in two weeks. Why don't you guys start warming up and um, we'll put something together for, for a couple, uh, you know, for a show here or there or whatever. Right, right. So that, that's how those like one off shows happened. So I have a great story about this show. And and I want to call it the the goat torso show, the goat torso uh, uh, story. <laughs> so I think that was at the wetlands. Okay, I but go ahead. I, I remember it being here. I could be wrong because I saw you guys at the wetlands too. So so I'm thinking it was here because I, I I seem to remember, but I, I saw you at the wetlands too. So let me. So for the sake of history, let's say it was here. It could have been the wetlands, right? So Carnivore is playing. And in great Carnivore tradition, Pete pulls out this goat carcass, right? It was just this skinned, full goat carcass, right? Like, you know, basically just a skinned, dead goat, right? Mm -hmm. And he throws it in the audience, right? Everybody proceeds to just rip the thing apart. And also... Also, there was a there was a bucket of, of goat eyes, right? There mm-hmm. was like there there was like goat eyes and and but the but the goat carcass gets tossed into the eagerly awaiting crowd, and the crowd rips it apart, right? And the next thing you know, there's 
there's goat parts flying all, o- all over the club, right? And like, you know, in your peripheral vision, you, you it, there's like pieces, there's, there's like a, a hoof, there's like a, a head, there's, there's pieces, all of a sudden it's, it, it's flying everywhere. And I'm standing there kind of towards the back of the club and I'm watching this. And all of a sudden through the corner of my eye, I see the goat torso launch on the other side of the club and it sort of goes <laughs> and I see it coming across and I sort of duck back a little bit and the girl that was standing next to me basically caught the goat torso right in the side of the head and I will never forget the sound that the goat torso made as it hit said girl on the side of the head the 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 the, the classic sound now the girl didn't get hurt. It was just a humorous moment at, 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 at a carnival sh- carnivore show that I would never forget. But the sound that I will never forget of the goat torso hitting female in the side of the face. It sounded like Rocky working out on the beef ribs, right? Yeah. It was, <laughs> yeah, thwack. Exactly. It was, <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, how pan how pandemics get started kids yeah 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 yeah, pretty much so but man uh just before we take the quick break how did this did you guys on the way to the show go hey let's stop it at at, at sort of the butcher shop was there a butcher shop you guys went to was this thought out this thing yeah absolutely a lot of money and thought went into that we had (laughs) we had you know we used to go to the halal meat markets on atlantic avenue I think, I think Mark used to pick them up. I think he used to get the quarts, of, the gallons of blood. We used to use real blood on stage. Yeah, yeah. And none it of the stunk, and it stunk. Yeah, on the stunk. yeah it stunk. <laughs> people used to talk about coming home on the train after a carnival show, soaked in blood, and getting eyed down by the cops. Like, <laughs> what, the fuck, what the fuck did they do? That Paris May, Paris May who says there were a lot of carcasses at their shows. Here's, you know, here's my uh, ah. My, Livestock Guardian. Who's that? That's Nana. Hey, Nana. How you doing? Yeah, she was Aww. quiet. She was good for most of the show. She was. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll speed it up. Let's take a quick break, like two or three minutes if you have to go to the bat, whatever, and we'll come yeah. back and we'll take some questions from around the world, okay? Yeah, I'd say about, I, I got to go in about uh, 10 minutes, so. We'll do it quick. Here All we right, go. Bro. All, All right, bro. There you have it. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Get your questions up quick for Louis Biedo. We are sponsored by blah, 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 and Upstate Records. They're a New York-based DIY independent metal and hardcore label. Founded in 2017, they broke into the scene with their inaugural 26-band compilation in 2018. And since have churned out over 80 releases in their brief five-year history. In 2023, look for releases by Mark Rizzo's new band, Revenge Beast. Carl from Earth Crisis is Fry, Fury of Five, Angry Corpses, and a few more surprises are in the work. Check them out at www.upstaterecordsnewyork.com and use the code STONE10 for 10% off. Last but not least, come on now. It is the Texas Silver Rush. They're a jewelry design firm and boutique store located in the birthplace of the Texas country music scene in Fredericksburg, Texas. They specialize in working with musicians in all music genres to design and create unique one-off faces as well as style them for stage, album covers, promo videos, and social media exposure. Their client list includes Rock Roll Hall of Famers, Greg Rolle, Ringo Starr, and of course, Agnostic Front. Information online sales are being taken at their Facebook and Instagram pages, and of course, www.thetexassilverrush.com. That said, let's bring our guest Louis Biedo back on. Let's see what questions we have. Um, oh yeah, this is a good question. This is a good one, and, and it's on my list. Uh, Eric uh, Welter asks, "Were you part of Carnivore AD?" And, and let me let me let me sort of modify that. What are your thoughts, feelings uh, about Carnivore AD as they're out there playing shows? Give us your take on that. Okay, Carnivore AD started um, with uh, um, Baron from Chia mm-hmm. Terra. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, he had a band uh, that was called um, Sex and Violence that mm-hmm. was basically a Carnivore cover band. And then <clears throat> Mark got involved. Um, and then I got involved. And at one point, um, you know, we were thinking of doing some shows and calling the band Carnivore AD. Mm. Um, we um, did that one show 
in uh, that Sid talked about earlier at, at the, the Bowery uh, Electric. Bowery Electric, uh, and I, I was involved in. I, I kind of quarterbacked you guys getting in there for that. Yeah. Okay, that was on Halloween. That was that was a great night, actually. I tell you, some of the bands that were there that that Sabbath cover band were great, and Chuck's band, uh, 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 Chuck from Chromag, uh from uh, Crumb Truckers. Yeah. Uh, he he played on on Paris's new record. Yep. And he also played in this van vibrator that mm. was insane. I mean, they made me nervous. They were fucking insane, man. Right. Um, but um, that was a good night. But anyway, um, that was um, – I, I kind of like did, only did half the show with them yeah. um, uh, because, you know, they, they have a drummer that's playing with them. So I didn't want to, uh, you know, consume the whole night, whatever. It was just sure. like a – like a like a like a guest appearance type of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, now, now Joe Cangelosi's playing drums, and um, Mark is no longer involved, and they're continuing. Uh, and Chuck is playing in That's Carnival right. AD. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, I mean, these are all people that um, are from our past. Uh, they um, th- they're doing the right thing, I think. You know that. I, I have no objection to. I love live music. I think a live representation. You know, I'm going to see Get the Lead Out tonight. It's not Zeppelin, but it's you know, it's a live show. I've said Zeppelin. it. Many, I've said it many times. It's a celebration of the music. Absolutely. So you yeah. know, uh, you know, you know, who am I to deprive uh, an audience of hearing Carnivore's music live being played pretty damn well by uh, by these guys? And you know, mm-hmm. um, so I have no objection to it. Um, I'm, uh, you know, I'm flattered. I'm, I'm you know, and I, you know, I, I think Pete would be too. I, uh, I don't think he would have any objection to this. You know, uh, that right on. That that's great. Uh, here, here's another. Th- this is a great. This is a great question. Um, did Louis play many shows with Agnostic Front? Thank you for the decades of enjoying the music he helped make make from. So. I, I, I remember we spoke about this. Um, I know you did play when, when after you did the record. Was it two shows, CBGB, yeah. something like that? I, I think it was just two shows, uh, one in one in Lemoore and one at CBGB's. And I remember the CBGB show. There were probably more people outside than there were inside. That you know, People outside that couldn't get into the club. That's how packed it was. It was, it was insane. Yeah, and and here's the CB's, this, I mean, how many people did CB's hold? Four, three hundred, maybe. Didn't four? you play? Is this? Didn't you play double duty that day? Did you play with both bands? Uh, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I think I did. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think so. I think we talked about this once. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I think you actually did. Uh, I think you 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 played. Uh, and the Crumb Suckers. What a bill, and, huh? and, and and the Crumb Suckers. Wow, right. that look, is look, something. Look you got to send that to me, uh, Drew. Sure. You got to send, send that picture to me. That's yeah, yeah. that's good one. Carnivore, Crumb Suckers, uh, C- Carnivore AF and Crumb Suckers, CBGB's matinee. <sighs> Man, talk about um, a show. Yeah, yeah. What a, what a bill is, but what, what a bill is right. Uh, I think this is this is. Uh, I think we'd be uh, we would be amiss not to ask this. Still playing drums. Last time I played drums was at Sal Abrascato's house. He recently moved down here to mm-hmm. Florida, and uh, we hooked up. And uh, he has a drum room where he has three John Bonham kits set up, and he <laughs> set one up lefty for me. I brought my pedals, and uh, we jammed. Me, Sal, and his daughter. <laughs> it was cool. I had a good time. How, um, how, go ahead. Go ahead. And, I, I, you know, actually that kind of, you know, I got a few blisters from that day and I was like, yeah, I should keep it up. So I don't have my drums set up, but I do have my pad and I break out the syncopation book and do some rudiments and, you know, just, uh, you know, try to keep the chops there, you know. Didn't you have a, wasn't there a shoulder issue? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that was, uh, that was, a. um, in fact, I remember we, uh, I remember Mark confirmed the show for them to play. With you guys, you know, for you, sure. uh, and 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 I wasn't ready for that show, and and that caused a problem. But I, I apologize for that. Do you think but, that was brought on by wear and tear uh, through the years of playing, or was that just, uh, just I, getting I, old? Yeah, I think just getting old. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, sure. You know, I I don't know. Sure. I mean, I, 
for some reason, my left arm has suffered so many different injuries. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it sucks because I'm lefty, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, just, just, uh, just wrapping it up here, this one last one, and then I have one. Uh, Pat Baldwin asks, looking back on your drumming legacy, is there a song or entire album that you're most proud of to, to have recorded? Um, first thing that comes to mind is the Cause for Alarm record. I think, um, I, I, you know, I, I think my performance on that was, um, was real driven. Um, I was, I was, I was out to like make a point, prove myself worthy of being on that record. So I had, um, I had a lot of ambition for that record. I mean, I had, you know, retaliation is, is a great record too. I'm, I'm real proud of that as well. There are some really, you know, cool things that I've done on that. Um, uh, the, you know, even the first record, I mean, I, I'll never forget when, you know, you, you hear it in the studio as a playback, you know, the first time listening to Predator and listening to that double bass, you know, like pounding in your chest. And, you know, I, you know, it, it gave me the goosebumps back then. But I think overall, um, uh, I, I would say the the, the, the uh, course for a mom record, uh, there's wow. some real, real um, I'm, I'm real proud of that record. That's that's fantastic, man. And and and, and of course, we've spoke about it before. Uh, what an incredible, long-lasting legacy uh, that that record has, and and it's inspired so much, so many people, man. That's you know, cool. It's really it, cool. It, it, it has. Uh, hey, listen. Last but not least, I, I just uh, this one. This one kind of co comes from me. Uh, you know, I know you were very close with Pete. Uh, Pete, you know, Pete passed away uh, very young. Um, could you give us any sort of perspective uh, on Pete or, or anything that, you know, uh, might be something that we might not know or, or, or something from your friendship with him? You know, Pete's popularity was so surreal. You know, it's so strange to see somebody that you were so close with become so recognized and acknowledged and, you know, seemingly loved by people. The, 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 you know, the idea of, of, of gaining admiration through music, I mean, it shouldn't be a foreign concept, but, but um, it, it's different when you actually know the person and you spent sure. time with them. Um, you know, Pete was, was such an entertainer. I mean, hanging out with Pete, anybody that, you know, knows Pete, you know, it's like knowing Vinny Stigma, you know, the character, the, the 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 pain in your side laughing that you can't even catch your breath and he fucking doesn't relent and he keeps it up and you fucking stop you're killing me i'm gonna fucking die over here i can't stop laughing so much i mean he was such a good time such a good friend such a um caring loving um person um you know i i you know <sighs> Here we go again. Uh, yeah. yeah. I miss him. I he haunts me. He mm. fucking haunts me. I dream about him like he's never like he never died. I have dreams like we're doing a show, like crazy shit. Like I'll have dreams like you know, like you know, we didn't get a sound check. Well, my drums aren't Mike Pete. What the fuck? You know, and, and wake up and be like you know. You know he's he's gone, but but in my sleep he's fucking alive. It's fucking crazy. Art art is like that, right? And, and the fact that you guys created this great music together and it, it lives forever and it's touched so it's, it's touched so many people. Like you could still hear him in your head. And I was for I was fortunate, you know, to have been able to work with them at, at a certain point as well. You know, me and Parrish did the. Uh, the black number one video and uh very very honored to have had the opportunity to, to have worked with them uh and, and that band you know yeah and i was so glad i mean i i remember i was going to culinary school um while they were recording the uh uh bloody kisses record and i stopped off at the studio to hear what you know what you know where they were at with it and uh right <laughs> And I came in with my culinary knives, and I'm showing them my knives and stuff like that. And, pizza plate. <laughs> and you know, it was really cool because you know, there was no hard feelings. It was all you know, right. we were all friends. You know, I, I, anybody, 
anybody that pays the price and puts the effort in to make it in this business deserves all the success that they can get. I begrudge nobody anything. They they deserve it. You know, you Drew, you what you're doing with your with your projects and Thank and you. this show. It's all it's all good stuff. It's all from Thank the you. heart. And um, you know, uh, I wish everybody success in what they in what they do. Everybody deserves happiness and um, success in what they love to do. They really do. Thank you so much for coming on, Louis. Um, I can't thank you enough. You know, I, 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 I'm sorry, I, I was such a holdout, man. <laughs> I, I, I worked hard at it, bro. I, and I would say, I, know, yeah. I said, bro, I'm not, I'm, I'm not gonna go. I'm not gonna. T I will. I'll, I'll come back. And I just, I just, I just wanted you so bad. I just wanted to connect with you so bad in this format. I'm so glad you did it from the bottom of my heart. I thank you so much, Louis. Uh, I'm glad to do it, Drew. Thank you for having me. Okay, I'll talk um, to you soon, my friend. All right. Take care. Right. And have a good time at the Led Zeppelin thing tonight. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Wow. Well, there you have it. Woo. Man. What a show. Told you. <laughs> I told you it was going to be great. Oh, man. What a great show. Whew. Man. We're 100 and, you know, you know next up. Uh, a week from today uh, is our 250th show with Lars from Rancid. Um, man, what a great run it's been, you know. And then, and then soon after that is the three-year anniversary show with Moby. Um, man, I, I'm just so fortunate, and I, I just I'm so grateful to have this opportunity to do this show. Um, I've really, <laughs> yeah, you know, shit. Who would have thunk it? You know, it was never part of my plan, but uh, life is like that sometimes. It takes you in, in those kind of twists and turns, and I'm fortunate. And I uh, want to thank everybody that came on today. Uh, Joel Ghostin, um, with some really heartfelt words about um, Louis' influence and Sid the Kid and, and Stephen Messina. And, uh, yeah. So, yeah, thank you. Um, 250th show is a week from today. Yeah. Um, and all that. Yeah, one of the best. Imagine that. One of the best shows so far. 200 and it's been more than 250 shows cuz cuz we've done bonus we've done bonus shows um you know and everything. So, but yeah, this was this was this was one of the great ones. There's been some great ones, man. There there's been there, there's there's been some great ones, you know. Um so and hey, hey and thank you. I want to shout out um I, I want to thank I want to thank Chris Contos. I, I, you've been out there the whole show, Chris. Uh, thank you. You know, and I, and I look forward to seeing you. Yes. Two, two fifties coming and, and thanks everybody. It's just, I don't, you know, yo, how about a couple of, want to see a couple of pictures just real quick, uh, that, that I didn't get a chance to put on the show. You know, Louis sent me, Louis sent me some great, some great stuff. Um, here's a couple that, that we didn't get, that we didn't get to, uh, to post on the show. How about Pete Steele at the CBGB matinee? Pete Steele, like when he shaved his head right across the street from CBGB's Pete Steele, Pete Steele skinhead, right? That, that, that's a good one. Um, here's a shot of Bobby, um, toxic Bob and Louie at the black and blue bowl. When, uh, agnostic front did the cause for alarm, uh, thing for two days. Uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of Brooklyn, a lot of Brooklyn going on there. Um, what else did I not, did I not get, uh, oh, this is a great one. You know, how, how could I, it is the carnivore at Lemoore, the, the swasifix as, as it is known as it is the, it is the swasifix, uh, one of Pete's creations, uh, Friday, September 23rd. 1988. Um, anything else? A lot, lot, lot of flyers that, that uh, I had in the collection. Here's a beautiful flyer um, from, uh, is it CBGB's? This is a Ludacris, the beautiful um, original artwork. Yes, yeah, CBGB's, um, Ludacris and, and Carnivore. 
really, really beautiful, uh, beautiful artwork there. Um, God, look at this one. How did we not, how did I not, did I not see this one? Suicidal Tendencies at Irving Plaza, two shows um, with Leeway, Carnivore, and Whiplash opening up on one night. We didn't even talk about Whiplash on the show, you know? Um, I, I saw the Whiplash is playing again. And then the second, Warzone, uh, Youth of Today, and Underdog. Wow. Incredible. In 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 incredible uh, lineups. Shouting out, um, shouting out, um, Michael Scandato. Uh, I know they just did the Confusion release. Here is, I think Scandato made this flyer. It's a Confusion, uh, you know, uh, Carnivore's last show at Lemoor with Confusion. You know, while, while we're on the, now, you know, while we're on the sort of, uh, on the, on the um, Lemoore uh, Confusion tip, shouting out uh, Michael Scandato and all the Scandato brothers. Um, so, so there you go. Uh, that said, uh, God, we covered a lot. Yeah. Right. A lot of emotions. It was heavy, man. It was a heavy show today. You know, Louie, 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 Louie Louis got, Louie, Louie, Louie got us emotional on today's. I think it might've been what the fifth time I've cried on the show. Michael Graves made me cry. Um, Evan Seinfeld, Mike judge, you know, but, and, 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 and Louie, Louie, Louie Beato. Um, so, so there you go. That said, uh, Hey, look, uh, let's get on with our lives. Thanks a lot for watching everybody. Uh, if you can, please, uh, you know, please, uh, join Patreon, support this show. It, it's how this whole thing works, man. I can't do it without your support. I appreciate everybody that, that has supported. We will see you in a week for the landmark 250th episode until then. Do good things and good things will come. Back.